Chapter Twenty Five of the English Governess at the Siamese Court by Anna H. Leonowitz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Subordinate King. A second or subordinate kingship is an anomalous device or provision of sovereignty peculiar to Siam, Cambodia, and Laos. Inferior in station to the supreme king only, and apparently deriving from the throne of the Phra Bats, to which he may approach so near, a reflected majesty and prestige, not clearly understood by his subjects, nor easily defined by foreigners. The second king seems to be, nevertheless, belittled by the very significance of the one exclusive privilege that should distinguish him that of exemption from the customary prostrations before the first king, whom he may salute by simply raising his hands and joining them above his head. Here his proper right of royalty begins and ends. The part that he may play in the drama of government is cast to him in the necessity, discretion, or caprice of his absolute chief next, and yet so far above him, it may be important, insignificant, or wholly omitted like any lesser ducus of the realm he must appear before his lord twice a year to renew his oath of allegiance in law he is as mere a subject as the slave who bears his battle-box or that other slave who on his knees and with averted face presents his spittoon in history he shall be what circumstance or his own mind may make him the shadow or the soul of sovereignty even as the intellectual and moral weakness or strength may have been apportioned between him and his colleague. From his rank he derives no advantage, but the chance. Som dech pra, pavarend rames mahiswarer, the subordinate king of Siam, who died on the 29th of December, 1865, was the legitimate son of the supreme king, second of his dynasty, who reigned from 1809 to 1824. His father had been second king to his grandfather, Grand Supreme of Siam, and first of the reigning line. His mother was lawful first queen consort, and the late first or major king, Somdech Pra Paramendr Mahamonkut, was his elder full brother. Being a like legitimate offspring of the first queen, these two lads were styled Somdech Chofas, celestial royal princes and during the second and third reigns they were distinguished by the titles of courtesy pertaining to their royal status and relation, the elder as Chofa Monkut, the younger as Chofa Chudni Mani, Monkut signifying royal crown, and Chudhamani royal hairpin. On the death of their father in 1824, and the accession by intrigue of their elder half-brother, the Chofa Monkut entered the Buddhist priesthood, but his brother, more ardent, inquisitive, and restless, took active service with the king, in the military as well as in the diplomatic department of government. He was appointed superintendent of artillery and Malayan infantry on the one hand, and on the other, translator of English documents and secretary for English correspondence. In a cautious and verbose sketch of his character and services, written after his death by his jealous brother, the priest king, wherein he is by turns meanly disparaged and damned with faint praise, we find this curious statement. After that time, 1821, he became acquainted with certain parties of English and East Indian merchants, who made their appearance or first commenced trading on late of second reign, after the former trade with Siam, which had been stopped or postponed several years, in consequence of some misunderstanding before. He became acquainted with certain parts of English language and literature, and certain parts of Hindu or Bengali language, as sufficient for some unimportant conversation with English and Indian strangers, who were visitors of Siam, upon the latter part of the reign of his royal father. But his royal father did not know that he possessed such knowledge of foreign language, which had been concealed to the native persons in republic affairs whose jealousy seemed to be strong against strangers. So he was not employed in any terms with those strangers' foreign affairs. That is, 
during the life of his father, at whose death he was just sixteen years old. Early in the third reign he was sent to Meek Long, to superintend the construction of important works of defense near the mouth of the Meek Long River. He pushed this work with vigor, and completed it in 1835. In 1842 he commanded successfully an expedition against the Cochin Chinese, and, in returning, brought with him to Siam many families of refugees from the eastern coast. Then he was commissioned by the king to reconstruct, after western models, the ancient fortifications at Paknam, and having to this end engaged a corps of European engineers and artisans, he eagerly seized the advantage the situation afforded him by free and intelligent intercourse with his foreign assistants to master the English language, so that, at his death, he notably excelled the first king in the facility with which he spoke, read, and wrote it, and to improve his acquaintance with the western sciences and arts of navigation, naval construction and armament, coast and inland defense, engineering, transportation, and telegraphy, the working and casting of iron, etc. On the 26th of May, 1851, Twelve days after the coronation of his elder brother, the student and priest Maha Mongkut, he was called by the unanimous voice of the king and council to be second king, and throughout his subordinate reign, his sagacious and alert inquiry, his quick apprehension, his energetic and liberal spirit of improvement, engaged the admiration of foreigners, whilst his handsome person, his generous temper, his gallant preference for the skilful and the brave, his enthusiasm and princely profusion in sports and shows, endeared him more and more to his people. Maha Mongkut, at no time inclined to praise him beyond his deserts, at least of all in the latter years of his life, embittered to both by mutual jealousy and distrust, wrote almost handsomely of him under the pressure of this public opinion. He made everything new and beautiful, and of curious appearance, and of a good style of architecture, and much stronger than they had formerly been constructed by his three predecessors, the second kings of the last three reigns, for the space of time that he was second king. He had introduced and collected many and many things, being articles of great curiosity, and things useful for various purposes of military acts and affairs, from Europe and America, China and other states, and placed them in various departments and rooms or buildings suitable for those articles, and placed officers for maintaining and preserving the various things neatly and carefully. He has constructed several buildings in European fashion and Chinese fashion, and ornamented them with various useful ornaments for his pleasure, and has constructed two steamers in manner of men of war, and two steam yachts, and several rowing state boats in Siamese and Cochin Chinese fashion, for his pleasure at sea and rivers of Siam, and caused several articles of gold and silver, being vessels and various wars and weapons, to be made up by the Siamese and Malayan goldsmiths, for employ and dress of himself and his family, by his direction or skilful contrivance and ability. He became celebrated and spread out more and more to various regions of the Siamese kingdom, adjacent states around, and far famed to foreign countries, even at far distance, as he became acquainted with many and many foreigners, who came from various quarters of the world, where his name became known to most as the very clever and bravest prince of Siam. As he pleased mostly with firing of cannon and acts of marine power and seamen, which he has imitated to his steamers, which were made in manner of the men of war, after he has seen various things curious and useful, and learned marine customs on board the foreign vessels of war, his steamers conveyed him to sea, where he was enjoyed playing of firing in cannon very often. He pleased very much in, and was playful of almost everything, some important and some unimportant, as riding on elephants and horses and ponies, racing of them, and racing of rowing boats, firing on birds and beasts of prey, dancing and singing in various ways pleasantly, and various curiosity of almost everything, and music of every description, and in taming of dogs, monkeys, etc., etc., 
that is to say briefly that he has tested almost everything eatable except entirely testing of opium and play also he has visited regions of northeastern province of sarapuri and goras very often for enjoyment of pleasant riding on elephants and horses at forests in chasing animals of prey fowling and playing music and singing with laos people of that region and obtaining young wives from there what follows is not more curious as to its form of expression than suspicious as to its meaning and motive to all who know with what pusillanimity at times the first king shrank from the approach of christian foreigners especially the french priests with what servility in his moody way he courted their favor it will appear of very doubtful sincerity to those who are familiar with the circumstances under which it is written and to whom the attitude of jealous reserve that the brothers occupied toward each other at the time of the second king's death was no secret it may seem even after due allowance is made for the prejudices or the obligations of the priest to cover an insidious though scarcely adroit design to undermine the honourable reputation the younger enjoyed among the missionaries and the cordial friendship with which he had been regarded by several of the purest of them certainly it is suspiciously of a piece with other passages quoted further on in which the king's purpose to disparage the merits of his brother and damage the influence of his name abroad is sufficiently transparent in this connection the reader may derive a ray of light from the fact that on the birth of the second king's first son an american missionary who was in terms of intimacy with the father named the child george washington and that child the prince george washington krom moon pavarvijagan is the present second king of siam but to maha Mongkut and his art of putting things he was rumoured to be baptized or near to be baptized in christianity but the fact it is false he was a buddhist but his faith and belief changed very often in favour of various sects of buddhism by the association of his wives and various families and of persons who were believers in various sects of the established religion of the siamese and laos peguan and burmese countries why should he become a christian when his pleasures consisted in polygamy and enjoyment and with young women who were practised in pleasant dancing and singing and who could not be easily given up at any time he was very desirous of having his sons to be english scholars and to be learned the art of speaking reading and writing in english well like himself but he said he cannot allow his sons to enter the christian missionary school as he feared his descendants might be induced to the christianity in which he did not please to believe pavarender ramesser had ever been the favourite and darling of his mother and it was in his infancy that the seeds of that ignoble jealousy were sown between the royal brothers which nourished so rankly and bore such noxious fruit in their manhood from his tenderest years the younger prince was remarkable for his personal beauty and his bright intelligence and before his thirteenth birthday had already learned all that his several masters could teach him from an old priest named fra Nait, i gathered many pleasant anecdotes of his childhood for example he related with peculiar pride how the young prince then but twelve years old being born one day in state through the eastern gate of the city to visit his mother's lotus gardens observed an old man half blind resting by the roadside commanding his bearers to halt he alighted from his sedan and kindly accosted the poor creature finding him destitute and helpless a stranger and a wayfarer in the land he caused him to be seated in his own sedan and borne to the gardens while he followed on foot here he had the old man bathed clad in fresh linen and entertained with a substantial meal and afterward he took his astonished client into his service as keeper of his cattle later in life the generous and romantic prince diverted himself with the adventurous beneficence of harun al rashid visiting the poor in disguise listening to the recital of their sufferings and wrongs and relieving them with ready largesse 
of charity and justice, and nothing so pleased and flattered him as to be called, in his assumed name of Nakbrat, the wise, to take part in their sports and fetes. The affectionate enthusiasm with which the venerable Pongi remembered his royal pupil was inspiring, and to see his eyes sparkle and his face glow with sympathetic triumph as he described the lad's exploits of strength or skill in riding, fencing, boxing, was a fine sight. But it was with saddened look and tone that he whispered to me that, at the prince's birth, the astrologer who cast his horoscope had foretold for him an unnatural death. This, he said, was the secret of the watchful devotion and imprudent partiality his mother had always manifested for him. For such a prince to come into even the empty name of power was to become subject to the evil eye of his fraternal lord and rival, for whose favor officious friends and superserviceable lackeys contended in scandalous and treacherous spyings of the second king's every action. Yet, meanly beset as he was, he contrived to find means and opportunity to enlarge his understanding and multiply his attainments, and in the end his proficiency in languages, European and Oriental, became as remarkable as it was laudable. It was by Mr. Hunter, secretary to the Prime Minister, that he was introduced to the study of the English language and literature, and by this gentleman's intelligent aid he procured the text-books which constituted the foundation of his educational course. In person he was handsome, for a Siamese, of medium stature, compact and symmetrical figure, and rather dark complexion. His conversation and deportment denoted the cultivation, delicacy, and graceful poise of an accomplished gentleman, and he delivered his English with a correctness and fluency, very noticeable free from the peculiar spasmodic effort that marked his royal brother's exploits in the language of Shakespeare. In his palace, which he had rebuilt after the model of an English nobleman's residence, he led the life of a healthy, practical, and systematical student. His library, more judiciously selected than that of his brother, abounded in works of science, embracing the latest discoveries. Here he passed many hours, cultivating a sound acquaintance with the results of investigation and experiment in the Western world. His partiality for English literature in all its branches was extreme. The freshest publications of London found their way to his tables, and he heartily enjoyed the creations of Dickens. For robust and exhilarating enjoyment, however, he had recourse to hunting expeditions and martial exercises in the drilling of his private troops. Punctually at daybreak every morning he appeared on the parade ground, and proceeded to review his little army with scrupulous precision, according to European tactics, after which he led his well-trained files to their barracks within the palace walls, where the soldiers exchanged their uniform for a working dress. Then he marched them to the armory, where muskets, bayonets, and sabres were brought out and severely scored. That done, the men were dismissed till the morrow. Among his courtiers were several gentlemen of Siam and Laos, who had acquired such a smattering of English as qualified them to assist the prince in his scientific diversions. Opposite the armory stood a pretty little cottage, quite English-looking, lighted with glass windows and equipped with European furniture. Over the entrance to this quaint tenement hung a painted sign in triumphant English. Watches and clocks made and repaired here. And hither came frequently the second king and his favorites, to pursue assiduously their harmless occupation of her luxury. Sometimes this eccentric entertainment was diversified with music, in which his majesty took a leading part, playing with taste and skill on the flute and several instruments of the Laos people. Such a prince should have been happy, in the innocence of his pastimes and the dignity of his pursuits. But the same accident of birth and station to which he owed his privileges and his opportunities imposed its peculiar disabilities and hindrances. His troubles were the troubles of a second king, who chanced to be also an ardent and aspiring man. 
weary with disappointment, disheartened in his honorable launching for just appreciation, vexed with the caprice and suspicions of his elder brother, oppressed by the ever-present tyranny of the thought, so hard for such a man to bear, that the woman he loved best in the land he was inexorably forbidden to marry, because, being a princess of the first rank, she might be offered and accepted to grace the harem of his brother. A mere prisoner of state, watched by the baleful eye of jealousy, and traduced by the venal tongues of courtiers, dwelling in the torment of uncertainty as to the fate to which his brother's explosive temper and the responsible power might devote him, hoping for no repose or safety but in his funeral urn, he began to grow hard and defiant, and that which, in the native freedom of his soul, should have been his noble steadfastness, degenerated into ignoble obstinacy. Among the innumerable mean torments with which his pride was persecuted was the continual presence of a certain doctor, who, by the king's command, attended him at all times and places, compelling him to use remedies that were most distasteful to him. He was gallantly kind and courteous toward women. No act of cruelty to any woman was ever attributed to him. His children he ruled wisely, though somewhat sternly, rendering his occasional tenderness and indulgence so much the more precious and delightful to them. Never had Siam a more popular prince. He was the embodiment of the most hopeful qualities, moral and intellectual, of his nation, especially was he the exponent and promise of its most progressive tendencies, and his people regarded him with love and reverence, as their trusty stay and support. His talents as a statesman commanded the unqualified admiration of foreigners, and it was simply the jealous and tyrannical temper of Maha Mongkut that forced him to retire from all participation in the affairs of government. At last the mutual reserve and distrust of the royal brothers broke out in open quarrel, provoked by the refusal of the first king to permit the second to borrow from the royal treasury a considerable sum of money. On the day after this order was dishonored, the prince set out with his congenial and confidential courtiers on a hunting expedition to the Laos province of Chigmai, scornfully threatening to entrap one of the royal white elephants and sell it to his supreme majesty for the sum he would not load. At Chiang Mai he was regally entertained by the tributary prince of that province, and no sooner was his grievance known that the money he required was laid at his feet. Too manly to accept the entire sum, he borrowed but a portion of it, and instead of taking it out of the country, decided to sojourn there for a time, that he might spend it to the advantage of the people. To this end he selected a lovely spot in the vicinity of Chiang Mai, called Saraburi, itself a city of some consideration, where bamboo houses line the banks of a beautiful river that traverses teak forests alive with large game. On an elevation near at hand, the second king erected a palace, substantially fortified, which he named Ban Sita, the home of the goddess Sita, and caused a canal to be cut to the eastern slope. Here he indulged freely and on an imposing scale in his favorite pastime of hunting, and privately took to wife the daughter of the king of Chiang Mai, the princess Sunartha Vismita. And here he was happy, only returning to Bangkok when called thither by affairs of state, or to take the semi-annual oath of allegiance. Among the prince's concubines at this time was a woman named Klip, envious, intriguing, and ambitious, who by consummate arts had obtained control of his majesty's cousin, an appointment of peculiar importance and trust in the household of an oriental prince. Finding that by no feminine devices could she procure the influence she coveted over her master's mind and affections, she finally had recourse to an old and infamous sorcerer styled Khun Hatena, Lord of Future Events. An adept of the black art, much consulted by women of rank from all parts of the country, and he, in consideration of some extraordinary fee, prepared for her a variety of charms, incantations, philtres, to be administered to the prince, in whose food daily for years 
she mixed the abominable monstrums. The poison did its work slowly but surely, and his sturdy life was gradually undermined. His strength quite gone, and his spirit broken. His despondency became so profound that he lost all taste for the occupations and diversions that had once delighted him, and sought relief in restless changing from one palace to other, and in consulting every physician he could find. It was during a visit to his favorite residence at Saraburi that the signs of approaching dissolution appeared, and the king's physician, fearing he might die there, took hurried steps to remove him to his palace at Bangkok. He was bound in a sedan, and lowered from his high chamber in the castle in his barge on the canal, at the foot of the cliff, and so, with all his household in train, transported to the palace of Krom Hluang Wong Si, physician to the king, and one of his half-brothers. Now miserably unnerved, the prince, once so patient, brave and proud, threw his arms round his kinsman's neck, and weeping bitterly, implored him to save him. But he was presently removed to his own palace, and laid in a chamber looking to the east. That night the prince expressed a wish to see his royal brother. The king hastened to his bedside in company with his excellency Cho Fya Sri Suri Wong Si, the Kralal Homi, or prime minister, and then and there a silent and solemn reconciliation took place. No words were spoken, only the brothers embraced each other, and the elder wept bitterly. But from the facts brought to light in that impressive meeting and parting, it was made plain that the second king died by slow poison, administered by the woman Cleep, plain to all but the second him himself, who died in ignorance of the means by which the tragic prophecy of his horoscope had been made good. In the very full account of his brother's death, which Mahamonkut thought it necessary to write, he was careful to conceal from the public the true cause of the calamity, fearing the foreign populace, and most of all the Laotians and Peguans, who were devoted to the prince, and might attach suspicion to himself, on the ground of his notorious jealousy of the second king. The royal physicians and the supreme council were sworn to secrecy, and the woman Cleep and her accomplice Khun Hatena, together with nine female slaves, were tortured and publicly paraded through the environs of Bangkok, though their crime was never openly named. Afterward they were thrown into an open boat, towed out on the Gulf of Siam, and there abandoned to the mercy of winds and waves, or death by starvation. Among the women of the palace the current report was that celestial avengers had slain the murderous crew with arrows of lightning and spears of fire. In His Majesty's account of the last days of his royal brother, we have the characteristic queerness of his English, and the scarcely less characteristic passage of Pecknissipian Kant. The lamentable patient second king ascertained himself that his approaching death was inevitable. It was great misfortune to him and his family indeed. His eldest son, Prince George, footnote, George Washington, end of footnote, Krum Moon Favarvijagan, aged twenty-seven years on that time, became very sick of painful rheumatism by which he has his body almost steady on his seat and bed, immovable to and fro, himself, since the month of October, 1865, when his father was absent from Bangkok, being at Ban Sita as aforesaid. When his royal father returned from Ban Sita, he arrived at his palace at Bangkok on 6th December. He can only be lifted by two or three men and placed in the presence of his father, who was very ill. But the eldest son forenamed Prince was little better, so before death of his father, as he can be raised to be stood by two men, and can cripple slowly on even or level surface, by securing and supporting of two men on both sides. When his father became worse and approaching the point of death, upon that time his father can see him scarcely, wherefore the second king, on his being worse, has said to his eldest and second daughters, the half-sisters of the eldest son, distempered, so as he cannot be in the presence of his father without difficulty, that he, the second king, forenamed, on that time was hopeless, and that he could not live more than a few days. 
he did not wish to do his last will regarding his family and property, particularly as he was strengthless to speak much, and consider anything deeply and accurately. He begged to entreat all his sons, daughters, and wives, that none should be sorry for his death, which comes by natural course, and should not fear for misery of difficulty after his demise. All should throw themselves under their faithful and affectionate uncle, the supreme king of Siam, for protection, in whom he had heartfelt confidence that he will do well to his family after his death, as such the action or good protection to several families of other princes and princesses in the royalty, who deceased before. He begged only to recommend his sons and daughters that they should be always honest and faithful to his elder full brother, the supreme king of Siam, by the same affection as to himself, and that they should have much more affection and respect toward paternal relative persons in royalty than toward their maternal relative persons, who are not royal descendants of his ancestors. On the twenty ninth December, eighteen sixty five, in the afternoon, the second king invited his majesty the supreme king, his elder full brother, and his excellency, Cho Fra Sri Surivongsi Samuha Fra Karlahome, the prime minister, who is the principal head of the government and royal cousin, to seat themselves near to his side on his bedstead, where he lay, and other principles of royalty and nobility, to seat themselves in that room where he was lying, that they might be able to ascertain his speech by hearing. Then he delivered his family and followers, and the whole of his property, to his majesty and his excellency for protection and good decision, according to consequences, which they would well observe. Not a word of that royal reconcilement, of that remorseful passion of tears, of that mute mystery of humanity, the secret spell of a burdened mother's love, working too late in the hearts of her headstrong boys. Not a word of that crowning embrace, which made the subordinate king supreme, by the grace of dying and forgiving. End of chapter 25 Chapter Twenty Six, Part One, of the English Governess at the Siamese Court, by Anna H. Leonowitz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Supreme King, His Character and Administration, Part One. Of Somde Fra Paramendra Mahamonkut, late Supreme King of Siam. It may safely be said, for all his capricious provocations of temper and his snappish greed of power, that he was, in the best sense of the epithet, the most remarkable of the Oriental princes of the present century, unquestionably the most progressive of all the supreme rulers of Siam, of whom the native historians enumerate not less than forty, reckoning from the founding of the ancient capital, Ayugia or Ayo Deva the abode of gods, in Anno Domini, 1350. He was the legitimate son of the king Fra Cho Fra Pute Lutlach, commonly known as Fenden Klang, and his mother, daughter of the youngest sister of the king, Somde Fra Boromach Raja Fra Puti Chot Fa, was one of the most admired princesses of her time, and is described as equally beautiful and virtuous, she devoted herself assiduously to the education of her sons, of whom the second, the subject of these notes, was born in 1804, and the youngest, her best beloved, was the late second king of Siam. One of the first public acts of the king, Fra Puti Lutlach, was to elevate to the highest honors of the state his eldest son, the Chofa Monkut, and proclaim him heir apparent to the throne. He then selected twelve noblemen, distinguished for their attainments, prudence, and virtue, most conspicuous among them the venerable but energetic duke Somdech Ong Jai, to be tutors and guardians to the lad. By these he was carefully taught, in all the learning of his time, Sanskrit and Pali formed his chief study, 
and from the first he aspired to proficiency in Latin and English, for the pursuit of which he soon found opportunities among the missionaries. His translations from the Sanskrit, Pali, and Madgathi mark him as an authority among Oriental linguists, and his knowledge of English, though never perfect, became at least extensive and varied, so that he could correspond, with credit to himself, with Englishmen of distinction, such as the Earl of Clarendon and Lord Stanley and Russell. In his eighteenth year he married a noble lady, descended from the Phya Tak Sin, who bore him two sons. Two years later the throne became vacant by the death of his father, but as the reader has already learned, his elder half-brother, who, through the intrigues of his mother, had secured a footing in the favor of the Senabavdi, was inducted by the royal council into power, unequal to the exploit of unseating the usurper, and fearing his unscrupulous jealousy, the Chofa Monkut took refuge in a monastery, and entered the priesthood, leaving his wife and two sons to mourn him as one dead to them. In this self-imposed celibacy he lived throughout the long reign of his half-brother, which lasted twenty-seven years. In the calm retreat of his Buddhist cloister, the contemplative tastes of the royal scholar found fresh entertainment, his intellectual aspirations a new incitement. He labored with enthusiasm for the diffusion of religion and enlightenment, and above all, to promote a higher appreciation of the teachings of Buddha, to whose doctrines he devoted himself with exemplary zeal throughout his sacerdotal career. From the Buddhist scriptures he compiled with reverent care an impressive liturgy for his own use. His private charities amounted annually to ten thousand tickles. All the fortune he accumulated, from the time of his quitting the court until his return to it, to accept the diadem offered by the Senabavdi. He expended either in charitable distributions, or in the purchase of books, sacred manuscripts, and relics for his monastery. Footnote. On the third reign he himself served his eldest royal half-brother by superintending the construction and revision of royal sacred books in royal libraries, so he was appointed the principal superintendent of clergymen's acts and works of Buddhist religion, and selector of religious learned wise men in the country during the third reign. From the pen of Mahamonkut. End of footnote. It was during this retirement that he wrote that notable treatise in defense of the divinity of the revelations of Buddha, in which he essays to prove that it was the single aim of the great reformer to deliver man from all selfish and carnal passions, and in which he uses these words. These are the only obstacles in the search for truth. The most solid wisdom is to know this, and to apply oneself to the conquest of oneself. Thus it is to become the enlightened, the Buddha. And he concludes with the remark of Asoka, the Indian king, That which has been delivered unto us by Buddha, that alone is well said, and worthy of our soul's profoundest homage. In the pursuit of his appointed ends, Mahamonkut was active and pertinacious. No labors varied him nor pains deterred him. Before the arrival of the Protestant missionaries, in 1820, he had acquired some knowledge of Latin and the sciences from the Jesuits. But when the Protestants came, he manifested a positive preference for their methods of instruction, inviting one or another of them daily to his temple to aid him in the study of English. Finally he placed himself under the permanent tutorship of the Reverend Mr. Caswell, an American missionary, and in order to encourage his preceptor to visit him frequently, he fitted up a convenient resting place for him on the route to the temple, where that excellent man might teach the poorer people who gathered to hear him. Under Mr. Caswell he made extraordinary progress in advanced and liberal ideas of government, commerce, even religion. He never hesitated to express his respect for the fundamental principles of Christianity, but once, when pressed too closely by his reverend Munshi, with what he regarded as the more pretentious and apocryphal portions of the Bible, he checked that gentleman's advance with the remark that has ever been remembered against him, I hate the Bible mostly. As high priest of Siam, 
the mystic and potential office, to which he was in the end exalted, he became the head of a new school, professing strictly the pure philosophy inculcated by Buddha. The law of compensation of many births and of final nifan, footnote, attainment of beatitude, but not nihilism, as the word and the idea are commonly defined. It is only to be idea of God as an ever-active creator that the new school of Buddhists is opposed, not to the deity as a primal source, from whose thought and pleasure sprang all forms of matter, nor can they be brought to admit the need of miraculous intervention in the order of nature. In this connection it may not be out of place to mention a remark that the king, still speaking as a high priest, having authority, once made to me on the subject of the miracles recorded in the Bible. You say that marriage is a holy institution, and I believe it is esteemed a sacrament by one of the principal branches of your sect. It is, of all the laws of the universe, the most wise and incontestable, pervading all forms of animal and vegetable life. Yet your God, meaning the Christian's God, has stigmatized it as unholy, in that he would not permit his son to be born in the ordinary way, but must needs perform a miracle in order to give birth to one divinely inspired. Buddha was divinely inspired, but he was only man. Thus it seems to me he is the greater of the two, because out of his own heart he studied humanity, which is but another form of divinity, and the carnal mind being by this contemplation subdued, he became the divinely enlightened. When his teacher had begun to entertain hopes that he would one day become a Christian, he came out openly against the idea, declaring that he entertained no thought of such a change. He admonished the missionaries not to deceive themselves, saying, You must not imagine that any of my party will ever become Christians. We cannot embrace what we consider a foolish religion. In the beginning of the year 1851, His Supreme Majesty, Prabhat Somdeh Phra Nak Klo, fell ill, and gradually declined until the 3rd of April, when he expired and the throne was again vacant. The dying sovereign, forgetting or disregarding his promise to his half-brother, the true heir, had urged with all his influence that the succession should fall to his eldest son. But in the assembly of the Senabavdi, Somdeh Ongjai, father of the present Prime Minister of Siam, supported by Somdeh Ongnoi, vehemently declared himself in favor of the high priest Chofa Mongkut. This struck terror to the illegitimates, and mainly availed to quell the rising storm of partisan conflict. Moreover, Ong Jai had taken the precaution to surround the persons of the princes with a formidable guard, and to distribute an overwhelming force of militia in all quarters of the city, ready for instant action at a signal from him. Thus the two royal brothers, with views more liberal as to religion, education, foreign trade, and intercourse, than the most enlightened of their predecessors had entertained, were firmly seated on the throne as first and second kings, and every citizen, native or foreign, began to look with confidence for the dawn of better times. Nor did the newly crowned sovereign forget his friends and teachers, the American missionaries. He sent for them and thanked them cordially for all that they had taught him, assuring them that it was his earnest desire to administer his government after the model of the limited monarchy of England, and to introduce schools where the Siamese youth might be well taught in the English language and literature and the sciences of Europe. Footnote. In this connection, the Reverend Messrs. Bradley, Caswell, House, Mattoon, and Dean are entitled to special mention. To their united influence, Siam unquestionably owes much, if not all, of her present advancement and prosperity. Nor would I be thought to detract from the high praise that is due to their fellow laborers in the cause of Christianity, the Roman Catholic missionaries, who are, and ever have been, indefatigable in their exertions for the good of the country, especially will the name of the excellent bishop, Monsignor Palego, be held in honor and affection by people of all creeds and tongues in Siam, 
as that of a pure and devoted follower of our common redeemer End of footnote. there can be no just doubt that at the time it was his sincere purpose to carry these generous impulses into practical effect for certainly he was in every moral and intellectual respect nobly superior to his predecessor and to his dying hour he was conspicuous for his attachment to a sound philosophy and the purest maxims of buddha yet we find in him a deplorable example of the degrading influence on the human mind of the greed of possessions and power and of the infelicities that attend it for though he promptly set about the reforming of abuses in the several departments of his government and invited the ladies of the american mission to teach in his new harem nevertheless he soon began to indulge his avaricious and sensual propensities and cast a jealous eye upon the influence of the prime minister the son of his stage old friend the duke ong jai to whom he owed almost the crown itself and of his younger brother the second king and of the neighboring princess of ching wai and cochin china he presently offended those two by their resolute display of loyalty in his hour of peril had seated him safely on the throne of his ancestors from this time he was continually exposed to disappointment mortification slights from abroad and conspiracy at home had it not been for the steadfast adherence of the second king and the prime minister the sceptre would have been wrested from his grasp and bestowed upon his more popular brother yet notwithstanding all this he appeared to those who observed him only on the public stage of affairs to rule with wisdom to consult the welfare of his subjects to be concerned for the integrity of justice and the purity of manners and conversation in his own court and careful by a prudent administration to confirm his power at home and his prestige abroad consider apart from his domestic relations he was in many respects an able and virtuous ruler his foreign policy was liberal he extended toleration to all religious sects he expended a generous portion of his revenues in public improvements monasteries temples bazaars canals bridges arose at his bidding on every side and though he fell short on his early promise he did much to improve the condition of his subjects for example at the instance of her britannic majesty's consul the honourable thomas george knox he removed the heavy boat tax that had so oppressed the poorer masses of the siamese and constructed good roads and improved the international chambers of judicature but as husband and kinsman his character assumes a most revolting aspect envious revengeful subtle he was as fickle and petulant as he was suspicious and cruel his brother even the offspring of his brother became to him objects of jealousy if not of hatred their friends must he thought be his enemies and applause bestowed upon them was odious to his soul there were many horrid tragedies in his harem in which he enacted the part of a barbarian and a despot plainly his conduct as the head of a great family to whom his will was a law of terror reflects abiding disgrace upon his name yet it had this redeeming feature that he tenderly loved those of his children whose mothers had been agreeable to him he never snubbed or slighted them and for the little princess chow fa ying whose mother had been to him a most gentle and devoted wife his affection was very strong and enduring but to turn from the contemplation of his private traits so contradictory and offensive to the consideration of his public acts so liberal and beneficent several commercial treaties of the first importance were concluded with foreign powers during his reign in the first place the siamese government voluntarily reduced the measurement duties on foreign shipping from nineteen hundred to one thousand tickles per fathom of ship's beam this was a brave stride in the direction of a sound commercial policy and an earnest of greater inducements to enterprising traders from abroad in eighteen fifty five a new treaty of commerce was negotiated with his majesty's government by his britannic majesty's plenipotentiary sir john bowring which proved of very positive advantage to both parties 
On the 29th of May, 1856, a new treaty, substantially like that with Great Britain, was procured by Townsend Harris, Esquire, representing the United States, and later in the same year, still another, in favor of France, through His Majesty's envoy, M. Montigny. Before that time, Portugal had been the only foreign government, having a consul residing at Bangkok. Now the way was open to admit a resident consul of each of the treaty powers, and shortly millions of dollars flowed into Siam annually, by channels through which but a few tens of thousands had been drawn before. Foreign traders and merchants flocked to Bangkok, and established rice mills, factories for the production of sugar and oil, and warehouses for the importation of European fabrics. They found a ready market for their wares, and an aspect of thrift and comfort began to enliven the once neglected and cheerless land. A new and superb palace was erected, after the model of Windsor Castle, together with numerous royal residences in different parts of the country, the nobility began to emulate the activity and munificence of their sovereign, and to compete with each other in the grandeur of their dwellings, and the splendor of their cortege. So prosperous did the country become, under the benign influence of foreign trade and civilization, that other treaties were speedily concluded with almost every nation under the sun and His Majesty found it necessary to accredit Sir John Bowring as plenipotentiary for Siam abroad. Early in this reign, the appointment of harbour master at Bangkok was conferred upon an English gentleman, who proved so efficient in his functions that he was distinguished with the fifth title of a Siamese noble. Next came a French commander and a French bandmaster for the royal troops. Then a custom house was established, and a live Yankee installed at the head of it, who was also glorified with the title of honor. Finally, a police force was organized, composed of trusty Malays, hired from Singapore, and commanded by one of the most energetic Englishmen to be found in the East. A measure which has done more than all others to promote a comfortable sense of law and order throughout the city and outskirts of Bangkok. It is to be remembered, however, in justice to the British Consul General in Siam, Mr. Thomas George Knox, that the sure though silent influence was his, whereby the minds of the King and the Prime Minister were led to appreciate the benefits that must occur from these foreign innovations. The privilege of constructing, on liberal terms, a line of telegraph through Malmain to Singapore, with a branch to Bangkok, has been granted to the Singapore Telegraph Company, and finally a sanitarium has been erected on the coast of Ankhin for the benefit of native and foreign residents needing the invigoration of sea air. Footnote. His Excellency Cho Fia Biba Krongs Mahad Kosa Dipute, the Frak Lang, Minister for Foreign Affairs, has built a sanitarium at Ankhin for the benefit of the public. It is for benefit of the Siamese, Europeans, or Americans, to go and occupy, when unwell, to restore their health. All are cordially invited to go there for a suitable length of time, and be happy, but are requested not to remain month after month, and year after year, and regard it as a place without an owner. To regard it in this way cannot be allowed, for it is public property, and others should go and stop there also. Advertisement, Siam Monitor, August the 29th, 1868. End of footnote. During his retirement in the monastery, the king had a stroke of paralysis, from which he perfectly recovered, but it left its mark on his face, in the form of a peculiar falling of the under lip on the right side. In person he was of middle stature, slightly built, of regular features and fair complexion. In early life he lost most of his teeth, but he had had them replaced with a set made of sapan wood, a secret that he kept very sensitively to the day of his death. Capable at times of the noblest impulses, he was equally capable of the basest actions. Extremely accessible to praise, he indiscriminately entertained every form of flattery, but his fickleness was such that no courtier could cajole him long. Among his favorite women was the beautiful princess Tongu Supia, 
sister to the unfortunate Sultan Mahmud, a Raja of Pahang. Falling fiercely in love with her on her presentation at his court, he procured her for his harem against her will, and as a hostage for the good faith of her brother. But as she, being Mohammedan, ever maintained toward him a deportment of tranquil indifference, he soon tired of her, and finally dismissed her to a wretched life of obsoleteness and neglect within the palace walls. The only woman who ever managed him with acknowledgment edged success was Kun Chompiam, hardly pretty, but well-formed, and of versatile tact, totally uneducated, of barely respectable birth, being Chinese on her father's side, yet was all endowed with a nice intuitive appreciation of character. Once conscious of her growing influence over the king, she contrived to foster and exercise it for years, with but a slight rebuff now and then. Being modest to a fault, even at times obnoxious to the imputation of prudishness, she habitually feigned excuses for non-attendance in his majesty's chambers, such as delicate health, the nursing of her children, mourning for the death of this or that relative, and voluntarily visited him only at rare intervals. In the course of six years she amassed considerable treasure, procured good places at court for members of her family, and was the means of bringing many Chinamen to the notice of the king. At the same time she lived in continual fear, was verily humble and conciliating toward her rival sisters, who pitied rather than envied her, and retained in her pay most of the female executive force in the palace. In his daily habits his majesty was remarkably industrious and frugal. His devotion to the study of astronomy never abated, and he calculated with respectable accuracy the great solar eclipse of August 1868. The French government, having sent a special commission, under command of the Baron Hugon Le Tourneur, to observe the eclipse in Sion, the king erected, at the place called Hua Wan, the whale's head, a commodious observatory, besides numerous pavilions varying in size and magnificence, for his majesty and retinue, the French commission, the governor of Singapore, Colonel Ord, and Sud, who had been invited to Bangkok by the king, and for ministers and nobles of Siam. Provision was made, at the cost of government, for the regal entertainment, in a town of booths and tabernacles, of the vast concourse of natives and Europeans, who followed his majesty from the capital to witness the sublime phenomenon, and a herd of fifty noble elephants were brought from the ancient city of Ayugia for service and display. The prospect becoming dubious and gloomy just at the time of first contact, ten o'clock, the prime minister archly invited the foreigners, who believed in an overruling providence, to pray to him, that he may be pleased to disperse the clouds long enough to afford us a good view of the grandest of eclipse. Presently the clouds were partially withdrawn from the sun, and his majesty observing that one twentieth of the disk was obscured, announced the fact to his own people by firing a cannon, and immediately pipes screamed and trumpets blared in the royal pavilion, a tribute of reverence to the traditional fable about the angel Rahu swallowing the sun. Both the king and prime minister, scorning the restraints of dignity, were fairly boisterous in their demonstrations of triumph and delight, the latter skipping from point to point to squint through his long telescope, at the instant of absolute totality, when the very last ray of the sun had become extinct, His Excellency shouted, Hurrah! 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 and scientifically disgraced himself. Leaving his spyglass swinging, he ran through the gateway of his pavilion, and cried to his prostate wives, Henceforth will you not believe the foreigner? But that other Excellency, Chao Fia Bhudra Bahai, Minister for Northern Siam, more orthodox, sat it dumbfoundered faith, and gaped at the awful deglogition of the angel Rahu. The government expended not less than a hundred thousand dollars on this scientific expedition, and the delegation from the foreign community of Bangkok approached His Majesty with an address of thanks for his indiscriminate hospitality. But the extraordinary excitement and exposure to the noxious atmosphere of the jungle proved inimical to the constitution of the king. 
On his return to Bangkok, he complained of general weariness and prostration, which was the prelude to fever. Foreign physicians were consulted, but at no stage of the case was any European treatment employed. He rapidly grew worse and was soon past saving. On the day before his death, he called to his bedside his nearest relatives, and parted among them such of his personal effects as were most prized by him, saying, I have no more need of these things, I must give up my life also. Buddhist priests were constant in attendance, and he seemed to derive much comfort from their prayers and exhortations. In the evening he wrote with his own hand a tender farewell to the mothers of his many children, eighty-one in number. On the morning of his last day, October the 1st, 1868, he dictated in the Pali language a farewell address to the Buddhist priesthood, the spirit of which was admirable, and clearly manifested the face of the dying man in the doctrines of the reformer, for he hesitated not to say, Farewell, ye faithful followers of Buddha, to whom death is nothing, even as all earthly existence is vain, all things mutable and death inevitable. Presently I shall myself submit to that stern necessity. Farewell, for I go only a little before you. Feeling sure that he must die before midnight, he summoned his half-brother, His Royal Highness Krom Hluang Wong Si, His Excellency the Prime Minister, Chow Fya Kralahome, and others, and solemnly imposed upon them the care of his eldest son, the Chow Fa Chula Lon Korn, and of his kingdom, at the same time expressing his last earthly wish, that the Sen above D, in electing his successor, would give their voices for one who should conciliate all parties, that the country might not be distracted by dissensions on that question. He then told them he was about to finish his course, and implored them not to give way to grief, nor to any sudden surprise, that he should leave them thus. That must befall all creatures that come into this world, and may not be avoided. Then turning his gaze upon a small image of his adored teacher, he seemed for some time absorbed in awful contemplation. Such is life, those were actually the last words of this most remarkable Buddhist king. He died like a philosopher, calmly and sententiously, soliloquizing on death and its inevitability. At the final moment, no one being near save his adopted son, Phrya Burut, he raised his hands before his face, as in his accustomed posture of devotion, then suddenly his head drooped backward, and he was gone. End of chapter 26, part 1。Chapter 26, part 2 of the English Governess at the Siamese Court by Anna H. Leonovens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The Supreme King, His Character and Administration, Part 2 That very night, without disorder or debate, the son above D elected his eldest son, Somdech Chofa Chulalon Korn, to succeed him, and the Prince George Washington, eldest son of the late Second King, to succeed to his father's subordinate throne, under the title of Krom Fra Raja Bovan Shathan Mongkok. The title of the present Supreme King, my amiable and very promising scholar, is Prabhat Somdech Fra Paramender Maha Chulalon Korn Kateklo Chou About a year after my first ill-omened interviews with Maha Mongkot, and when I had become permanently installed in my double office of teacher and scribe, I was one day busy with a letter from His Majesty to the Earl of Clarendon, and finding that any attempt at partial correction would but render his meaning more ambiguous, and impair the striking originality of his style, I had abandoned the effort, and set about copying it with literal exactness, only venturing to alter here and there a word, such as I hasten with willful pleasure to write in reply, to your lordship's well-wishing letter, etc., whilst I was thus involving 
with from the depth of my inner consciousness a satisfactory solution to this conundrum in King's English. His Majesty's private secretary lolled in the sunniest corner of the room, stretching his dusky limbs and heavily nodding, in an ecstasy of ease-taking. Poor Fra Alak, I never knew him to be otherwise than sleepy, and his sleep was always stolen. For his majesty was the most capricious of kings, as to his working moods, busy when the average man should be sleeping, sleeping while letters, papers, dispatches, messengers, mailboats waited. More than once had we been aroused at dead of night by noisy female slaves, and dragged in hot haste and consternation to the hall of audience, only to find that his majesty was, not at his last gasp, as we had feared, but simply bothered to find in Webster's dictionary some word that was to be nowhere but in his own fertile brain, or perhaps in excited chase of the classical term for some trifle he was on the point of ordering from London, and that word was sure to be a stranger to my brain. Before my arrival in Bangkok it had been his not uncommon practice to send for a missionary at midnight, have him beguiled or abducted from his bed, and conveyed by boat to the palace, some miles up the river, to inquire if it would not be more elegant to write murky instead of obscure, or gloomily dark, rather than not clearly apparent. And if the wretched man should venture to declare his honest preference for the ordinary over the extraordinary form of expression, he was forthwith dismissed with irony, arrogance, or even insult, and without a word of apology for the rude invasion of his rest. One night, a little after twelve o'clock, as he was on the point of going to bed like any plain citizen of regular habits, his majesty fell to thinking how most accurately to render into English the troublesome Siamese word fi, which admits of a variety of interpretations. Footnote. Ghost, spirit, soul, devil, evil angel. End of footnote. After puzzling over it for more than an hour, getting himself possessed with the word as with the devil it stands for, and all to no purpose, he ordered one of his lesser state barges to be manned, and dispatched with all speed for the British consul. That functionary, inspired with lively alarm by so startling a summons, dressed himself with unceremonious celerity, and hurried to the palace, conjecturing on the way all imaginable possibilities of politics and diplomacy, revolution or invasion. To his vexation, not less than his surprise, he found the king in this habit, engaged with the Siamese English vocabulary, and mentally divided between Doyce and Devil, in the choice of an equivalent. His preposterous majesty gravely laid the case before the consul, who, though inwardly chafing at what he termed the confounded coolness of the situation, had no choice but to decide with grace, and go back to bed with philosophy. No wonder, then, that Fra Alak experienced an excess of gratitude for the privilege of napping for two hours in a snuggery of sunshine. Mam Kha, footnote Kha, your slave, end of footnote, he murmured drowsily, I hope that in the Chat Na, footnote, the next state of existence, end of footnote, I shall be a freed man. I hope so sincerely, Fra Alak, said I. I hope you'll be an Englishman or an American, for then you'll be sure to be independent. It was impossible not to pity the poor old man, stiff with continual stooping to his task, and so subdued, liable not only to be called at any hour of the day or night, but to be threatened, cuffed, kicked, beaten on the head. Footnote. The greatest indignity a Siamese can suffer. End of footnote. Every way abused and insulted, and the next moment to be taken into favor, confidence, bosom friendship, even as his majesty's mood might veer. Alack for Fra Alack! Though usually he bore with equal patience his greater and his lesser ills, there were occasions that sharply tried his meekness, when his weak and goaded nature revolted, and he rushed to a snug little home of his own about forty yards from the grand palace, there to snatch a respite of rest and refreshment in the society of his young and lately wedded wife. Then the king would awake and send for him. 
whereupon he would be suddenly ill or not at home, strategically hiding himself under a mountain of bedclothes and detailing Mrs. Fra Alak to reconnoitre and report. He had tried this primitive trick so often that its very staleness infuriated the king, who invariably sent officers to seize the trembling accomplice and lock her up in a dismal cell as a hostage for the scribe's appearance. At dusk the poor fellow would emerge, contrite and terrified, and prostrate himself at the gate of the palace. Then his majesty, who, having spies posted in the every quarter of the town, knew as well as Fra Alak himself, what the illness or the absence signified, leisurely strode forth, and finding the patient on the threshold, flew always into a genuine rage, and prescribed decapitation on the spot, and sixty lashes on the bare back, both in the same breath. And while the attendants flew right and left, one for the blade, another for the thong, the king, still raging, seized whatever came most handy, and belabored his bosom friend on the head and shoulders. Having thus summarily relieved his mind, he dispatched the royal secretary for his ink, horn, and papyrus, and began inditing letters, orders, appointments, before scimitar or lash, which were ever tenderly slow on these occasions, had made its appearance. Perhaps in the very thick of his dictating he would remember the connubial accomplice, and order his people to release her and let her go. Slavery in Siam is the lot of men of much finer intellectual type than any who have been its victims in modern times in societies farther west. Fra Alak had been his majesty's slave when they were boys together. Together they had played, studied, and entered the priesthood. At once bondman, comrade, classmate, and confidant, he was the very man to fill the office of private secretary to his royal crony. Virgil made a slave of his a poet, and Horace was the son of an emancipated slave. The Roman leech and, and Hirurgion were often slaves. So too, the preceptor and the pedagogue, the reader and the player, the clerk and the amanuensis, the singer, the dancer, the wrestler and the buffoon, the architect, the smith, the weaver and the shoemaker, even the armiger or squire, was a slave. Educated slaves exercised their talents and pursued their callings from the emulant of their masters. And thus it is today in Siam. Mutato nomine de te fabula narratur fra alak. The king's taste for English composition had by much exercise developed itself into a passion. In the pursuit of it he was indefatigable, rambling, and petulant. He had Webster's unabridged on the brain, an exasperating form of king's evil. The little dingy slips that emanated freely from the palace press were an, as indiscriminate as they were quaint. No topic was too sublime or too ignoble for them. All was copy that came to those cases from the glory of the heavenly bodies to the nuisance of the busy bodies who scalded his majesty through the columns of the Bangkok recorder. I have before me, as I write, a circular from his pen, and in the type of his private press, which being without caption or signature, may be supposed to be addressed to all whom it may concern. The American missionaries had vexed his exact scholarship by their peculiar mode of representing in English letters the name of a native city, Pripri, or, in Sanskrit, Bejrepuri. Whence this droll circular, which begins with a dogmatic line? None should write the name of city of Pripri thus, P'et, Cha, Puri. Then comes a pedantic demonstration of the derivation of the name from the compound Sanskrit word, signifying Diamond City and the document concludes with a characteristic explosion of impatience, at once critical, royal, and anecdotal. Ah, what the romanization of American system that Patch Abbey will be! Will whole human learned world become the pupil of their corrupted Siamese teachers? It is very far from correctness. Why they did not look in Journal of Royal Asiatic Society, where several words of Sanskrit and Pali were published continually, 
their Siamese priestly teachers considered all Europeans as very heathen, to them far from sacred tongue, and were glad to have American heathens to become their scholars or pupils. They thought they have taught sacred language to the part of heathen. In fact, they themselves are very far from sacred language, being sunk deeply in corruption of sacred and learned language, for tongue of their former Laos and Cambodian teachers, and very far from knowledge of Hindustani, Tsinghalese, and Royal Asiatic Society's knowledge in Sanskrit, as they are considered by such the Siamese teachers as heathen, called by them Mitcha Thiti, etc., etc., wrongly seer or spectator, etc., etc. In another slip, which is manifestly an outburst of the royal petulance, his majesty demands, in a displayed paragraph, Why name of Mr. Knox, Thomas George Knox, Esquire, British Council, was not published thus, Miss Knox or Nafk, if name of Cho Fya Buddha Rabhai is to be thus, Praya Pu Ta Rabhi, and why the London was not published thus, London or London, if Bejrepuri is to be published Pech Aburi. In the same slip with the philological protest, the following remarkable paragraphs appear. What has been published in number 25 of Bangkok Recorder thus. The King of Siam, on reading from some European paper, that the Pope had lately suffered the loss of some precious jewels, in consequence of a thief, having got possession of his holiness keys, exclaimed, What a man! Professing to keep the keys of heaven, and cannot even keep his own keys. The king on perusal thereof denied that it is false. He knows nothing about his holiness the Pope's sustaining loss of gems, etc., and has said nothing about religious faith. This is curious, in that it exposes the king's unworthy fear of the French priesthood in Siam. The fact is that he did make the rather smart remark in precisely these words, Ah, what a man! professing to keep the keys of heaven, and not able to guard those of his own bureau. And he was quite proud of his hit. But when it appeared in the recorder, he thought it prudent to bar it with a formal denial. Hence the politic little item which he sent to all the foreigners in Bangkok, and especially to the French priests. His Majesty's mode of dealing with newspaper structures, not always just, and suggestions, not always pertinent, aimed at his administration of public affairs, or the constitution and discipline of his household, was characteristic. He snubbed them with sententious arrogance, leavened with sarcasm. When the recorder recommended to the king the expediency of dispersing his Solomonic harem and abolishing polygamy in the royal family, his majesty retorted with a verbal message to the editor, to the purport that, when the recorder shall have dissuaded princes and noblemen from offering their daughters to the king as concubines, the king will cease to receive contributions of women in that capacity. In August 1865, an angry alteration occurred in the Royal Court of Equity, sometimes styled the International Court, between a French priest and Fia Viset, a Siamese nobleman, of venerable years, but positive spirit and energy. The priest gave Fiaviset the lie, and Fiaviset gave it back to the priest, whereupon the priest became noisy. Afterward he reported the affair to his council at Bangkok, with the embellishing statement that not only himself, but his religion had been grossly insulted. The consul, one Monsieur Albert Red, a peppery and pugnacious Frenchman, immediately made a demand upon his majesty for the removal of Yahweh Set from office. This dispatch was sent late in the evening by the hand of Monsieur Lamarche, commanding the troops at the royal palace, and that officer had the consul's order to present it summarily. Lamarche managed to procure admittance to the penetralia, and presented the note at two o'clock in the morning, in violation of reason and courtesy as well as of rules, excusing himself on the ground that the dispatch was important and his orders peremptory. His Majesty then read the dispatch and remarked that the matter should be disposed of to-morrow. 
Lamarche replied very presumptuously that the affair required no investigation, as he had heard the offensive language of Yavizet, and that person must be deposed without ceremony. Whereupon His Majesty ordered the offensive foreigner to leave the palace. Lamarche repaired forthwith to the consul, and reported that the king had spoken disrespectfully, not only of his imperial majesty's consul, but of the emperor himself, besides outrageously insulting a French messenger. Then the fire-eating functionary addressed another dispatch to his majesty, the purport of which was, that, in expelling Lamarche from the palace, the king of Siam had been guilty of a political misdemeanor, and had rudely disturbed the friendly relations existing between France and Siam, that he should leave Bangkok for Paris, and in six weeks lay his grievance before the emperor, but should first proceed to Saigon, and engage the French admiral there to attend to any emergency that might arise in Bangkok. His Majesty, who knew how to confront the uproar of vulgarity and folly with the repose of wisdom and dignity, sent his own cousin, the prince Mom Rochide, chief judge of the royal court of equity, to M. Aubaret, to disabuse his mind, and impart to him all the truth of the case. But the furious Frank seized the imposing magnate by the hair, drove him from his door, and flung his betel box after him, a reckless impulse of outrage as monstrous as the most ingenious and deliberate brutality could have devised. Rudely to seize a Siamese by the hair, is an indignity as grave as to spit in the face of a European, and the battle box beside being a royal present, was an essential part of the insignia of the prince's judicial office. On a later occasion this same Aubaret seized the opportunity a royal procession afforded to provoke the king to an ill-timed discussion of politics, and to prefer an intemperate complaint against the Kralahomi, or prime minister, this characteristic flourish of ill-temper and bad manners, from the representative of the politest of nations, naturally excited lively indignation and disgust among all respectable dwellers, native or foreign, near the court, and a serious disturbance was imminent. But a single dose of the king's English sufficed to soothe the spasmodic official, and reduce him to a sense of his situation. To the honour Monsignor Aubaret, the consul for His Majesty. Sir, the verbal insult or bad words without any step more over from lower or lowest person is considered very slight and inconsiderable. The person, standing on the surface of the ground or floor, cannot endure the heavenly bodies or any highly hanging lamp or globe by ejecting his spit from his mouth upward it will only endure his own face without attempting of heavenly bodies, etc. The Siamese are knowing of being lower than heaven do not endeavor to endure heavenly bodies with their spit from mouth. A person who is known to be powerless by every one, as they who have no arms or legs to move, oppose, or endure, or deaf, or blind, etc., etc., cannot be considered and said that they are our enemies, even for their madness in vain. It might be considered as easily agitation or uneasiness. Persons under strong desires, without any limit or acting under illimited anger, sometimes cannot be believed at once without testimony or witness, if they stated against any one verbally from such the statements of the most desirous or persons most illimitedly angry, hesitation and mild inquiry is very prudent from persons of considerable rank. No signature. Never were simplicity with shrewdness, and unconscious humor with pathos, and candor with irony, and political economy with the sense of an awful bore, more quaintly blended than in the following extraordinary hint, written and printed by His Majesty, and freely distributed for the snubbing of visionary or speculative adventurers. Notice. When the general rumor was and is spread out from Siam, circulated among the foreigners to Siam, chiefly Europeans, Chinese, etc., in three points. First, that Siam is under quite absolute monarchy. Whatever her supreme sovereign commanded, allowed, etc., all cannot be resisted by any one of his subjects. 
Second, the treasury of the sovereign of Siam was full for money, like a mountain of gold and silver, her sovereign most wealthy. Three, the present reigning monarch of Siam is shallow-minded and admirer of almost everything of curiosity, and most admirer of European usages, customs, sciences, arts, and literature, etc., without limit. He is fond of flattering term and ambitious of honor, so that there are no many opportunities and operations to be embraced for drawing great money from royal treasury of Siam, etc., the most many foreigners, being under belief of such general rumour, were endeavouring to draw money from him in various operations, as aiming him with valuable curiosities and expectations of interest, and flattering him to be glad of them, and deceiving him in various ways, almost on every opportunity of steamer coming to Siam, various foreigners partly known to him, and acquainted with him, and generally unknown to him, boldly wrote to him in such the term of various application and treatment, so that he can conclude that the chief object of all letters written to him is generally to draw money from him, even unreasonable. Several instances and testimonies can be shown for being example on this subject. The foreigner's letters addressed to him come by every one steamer of Siam, and of foreign steamers visiting Siam, ten and twelve at least, and forty at highest number urging him in various ways, so he concluded that foreigners must consider him only as a mad king of a wild land. He now states that he cannot be so mad more, as he knows and observes the consideration of the foreigners towards him. Also he now became of old age, footnote, he was sixty-two at this time, end of footnote, and was very sorry to lose his principal members of his family, namely, his two queens, twice, and his younger brother, the late second king, and his late second son, and beloved daughter, and moreover, now he fear of sickness of his eldest son. He is now unhappy, and must solicit his friends in correspondence, and others who please to write for the foresaid purpose, that they should know suitable reason in writing to him, and shall not urge him as they would urge a madman. And the general rumours forementioned, are some exaggerated, and some entirely false. They shall not believe such rumours deeply and ascertainly. Royal Residence, Grand Palace, Bangkok, 2nd July, 1867. And now observe this, what gracious ease this most astute and discriminating prince could fit his tone to the sense of those who, familiar with his opinions, and reconciled to his temper and his ways, however peculiar, could reciprocate the catholicity of his sympathies, and appreciate his enlightened efforts to flinch off that tenacious old man of the sea custom, and extricate himself from the predicament of conflicting responsibilities. To these, on the Christian New Year's Day of 1867, he addressed this kindly greeting. S.P.P. M. Moncot Called in Siamese, Fra Chong Lao Chao Yuhua in Magadhi or language of Pali, Siamikana Maharaja, in Latin, Rex Siamensium, in French, Le Roy de Siam, in English, the King of Siam, and in Malayan, Raja Mahapasach, etc., begs to present his respectful and regardful compliments and congratulations in happy lives during immediately last year, and wishes the continuing thereof during the commencing new year and ensuing and succeeding merry years, to his foreign friends, both now in Siam, namely, the functionary and acting consuls and consular officers of various distinguished nations in treaty power with Siam, and certain foreign persons under our salary, in service in any manner here, and several gentlemen and ladies who are resident in Siam in various stations, namely, the priests, preachers of religion, masters and mistresses of schools, workmen and merchants, etc., and now abroad in various foreign countries and ports, who are our noble and common friends, acquainted either by ever having had correspondences mutually with us some time, at anywhere, and remaining in our friendly remembrance or mutual remembrance, and whosoever are in service to us, as our consuls, vice-consuls, and consular assistants, in various foreign ports, 
let them know our remembrance and good wishes toward them all. Though we are not Christians, the forenamed king was glad to arrive this day in his valued life, as being the twenty-seven thousand seven hundred twentieth day of his age, during which he was aged sixty-two years and three months, and being the five thousand seven hundred eleventh day of his reign, during which he reigned upon his kingdom fifteen years and eight months after the current months. In like manner he was very glad to see and know and hope for all his royal family, kindred and friends of both native and foreign, living near and far to him, had arrived to this very remarkable anniversary of the commencement of solar year in Anno Christi, 1867. In their all being healthy and well living like himself, he begs to express his royal congratulation and respect and graceful regards to all his kindred friends, both native and foreign, in hopes to receive such the congratulation and expression of good wishes toward him and members of his family in very like manner, as he trusts that the amity and grace to one another of every of human beings who are innocent is a great merit and is righteous and praiseworthy in the religious system of all civil religion and best civilized laws and morality, etc. Given at the Royal Audience Hall, Anand Samagum, Grand Palace, Bangkok, etc., etc. The remoter provinces of Siam constitute a source of continual anxiety and much expense to the government, and to His Majesty, who, very conscious of power, was proud to be able to say that the Malayan territories and Rajas, Cambodia, with her marvellous cities, palaces, and temples, once the stronghold of Siam's most formidable and implacable foes, the Laos country, with its warlike princes and chiefs, were alike dependencies and tributaries of his crown. It was intolerably irritating to find Cambodia rebellious. So long as his government could successfully maintain its supremacy here, that country formed a sort of neutral ground between his people and the Cochin Chinese, a geographical condition which was not without its political advantages. But now the unscrupulous French had strutted upon the scene, and with a flourish of diplomacy and a stroke of the pen, appropriated to themselves the fairest portion of that most fertile province. His Majesty, though secretly longing for the intervention and protection of England, was deterred by his almost superstitious fear of the French from complaining openly, but whenever he was more than commonly annoyed by the pretensions and aggressive epistles of his imperial majesty's consul, he sent for me, thinking, like all Orientals, that being English, my sympathy for him and my hatred of the French were jointly a foregone conclusion. When I would have assured him that I was utterly powerless to help him, he cut me short with a wise whisper to consult Mr. Thomas George Knox, and when I protested that that gentleman was too honourable to engage in a secret intrigue against a colleague, even for the protection of British interests in Siam, he would rave at my indifference, the cupidity of the French, the apathy of the English, and the fatuity of all geographers in setting down the form of government in Siam as an absolute monarchy. I, an absolute monarch, for I have no power over French, Siam is like a mouse before an elephant. Am I an absolute monarch? What shall you consider me? Now as I considered him a particularly absolute and despotic king, that was a trying question, so I discreetly held my peace, fearing less to be classed with those obnoxious savants who compile geographies than to provoke him afresh. I have no power, he scolded. I am not absolute. If I point the end of my walking stick at a man, whom, being my enemy, I wish to die, he does not die but lives on, in spite of my absolute will to the contrary. What does geographies mean? How can I be an absolute monarchy? Such a conversation we were having one day, as he assisted at the founding of a temple, and while he reproached his fate that he was powerless to point the end of his walking stick, with absolute power at the peppery, and presumptuous Monsieur Albaret, he vacantly flung gold and silver coins among the workmen. 
In another moment he forgot all French encroachments, and the imbecility of geographers in general, as his glance chanced to fall upon a young woman of fresh and striking beauty, and delightful piquancy of ways and expression, who with a clumsy club was pounding fragments of pottery, urns, vases, and goglets, for the foundation of the vat. Very artless and happy she seemed, and free as she was lovely, but the instant she perceived she had attracted the notice of the king, she sank down and hid her face in the earth, forgetting or disregarding the falling vessels that threatened to crush or wound her. But the king merely diverted himself with inquiring her name and parentage, and someone answering for her, he turned away. Almost to the latest hour of his life, his majesty suffered, in his morbid egoism, various and keen annoyance, by reason of his sensitiveness to the opinions of foreigners, the encroachments of foreign officials, and the strictures of the foreign press. He was agitated by a restless craving for their sympathy on the one hand, and by a futile resentment of their criticisms or their claims on the other. An article in a Singapore paper had administered moral correction to His Majesty on the strength of a rumour that the king has his eye upon another princess of the highest rank, with a view to constituting her a queen consort. And the Bangkok recorder had said, now considering that he is full threescore and three years of age, that he has already scores of concubines and about fourscore sons and daughters, with several chofas among them, and hence eligible to the highest post of honour in the kingdom, this rumour seems too monstrous to be credited. But the truth is, there is scarcely anything too monstrous for the royal polygamy of Siam to bring forth. By the light of this explanation, the meaning of the following extract from the postscript of a letter, which the king wrote in April 1866, will be clear to the reader, who, at the same time, in justice to me, will remember that by the death of his majesty, on the 1st of October, 1868, the seal of secrecy was broken. Very private postscript. There is a newspaper of Singapore, entitled Daily News, just published after last arrival of the steamer Chophia in Singapore, in which paper, a correspondence from an individual resident at Bangkok, dated 16th March, 1866, was shown, but I have none of that paper in my possession. I did not notice its number and date to state to you now, but I trust such a paper must be in hand of several foreigners in Bangkok. May you have read it, perhaps. Otherwise you can obtain the same from any one or by order to obtain from Singapore. After perusal thereof, you will not be able to deny my statement forementioned. Moreover, as general people, both native and foreigners, here seem to have less pleasure on me and my descendant than their pleasure and hope on another amiable family to them until the present day. What was said there, in for a princess considered by the speaker or writer as proper, or suitable to be head of my harem, a room or part or confinement of women of Eastern Monarch? Footnote. A parenthetical drollery inspired by the dictionary. There is no least intention occurred to me, even once or in my dreams indeed, I think if I do so, I will die soon, perhaps. This my handwriting, or content hereof, shall be kept secretly. I beg to remain, your faithful well-wisher. S.P.P.M. Moncot, E.S. On 5,441st day of the reign. The writer here of beg to place his confidence on you always. As a true friend to his majesty, I deplore the weakness which betrayed him into so transparent a sham of virtuous indignation. The princess of the highest rank, whom the writer of the article plainly meant, was the princess of Chiang Mai, but from lack of accurate information he was misled into confounding her with the princess Tui Duang Prava, his majesty's niece. The king could honestly deny any such intention on his part with regard to his niece, but at the same time he well knew that the writer erred only as to the individual, and not as to the main fact, of the case. The princess of Chiang Mai was the wife, and the princess Tui Duang the daughter, of his full brother, the second king, lately deceased. 
much more agreeable it is, to the reader I doubt not, not less than to the writer, to turn from the king, in the exercise of his slavish function of training honest words, to play the hypocrite for ignoble thoughts, to the gentleman, the friend, the father, giving his heart a holiday, in the relaxations of simple kindness and free affection, as in the following note. Dated Rancho Puri, the 14th February, 1865. To Lady L., her son Louis Bangkok. We having very pleasant journey to be here, which is a township called as above named by men of Republic affairs in Siam, and called by common people a spark freak, where we have our stay a few days, and will take our departure from hence at dawn of next day. We thinking of you both regardfully, and beg to send here with some wild apples and berries, which are delicate for tasting, and some tobacco which were and are principal product of this region, for your kind acceptance, hoping this wild present will be acceptable to you both. We will be arrived at our home Bangkok on early part of March. We beg to remain, your faithful, S.P.P.M. Moncot, E.S., in 5035th day of reign, and your affectionate pupils, Jing Julax, Mane Ab Thadahorn, Somdek Chofa, Chulalan Korn, footnote, the present king, end of footnote, Kritahinihar, Prabhasor, Somavati. End of chapter 26. Chapter 27 of the English Governess at the Siamese Court by Anna H. Leon Owens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Retirement from the Palace In 1864 I found that my labors had greatly increased. I had often to work till ten o'clock at night to accomplish the endless translations required of me. I also began to perceive how continually and closely I was watched, by how and by whom it seemed impossible to discover. Among the inducements to me to accept the position of teacher to the royal family was His Majesty's assurance that if I gave satisfaction, he would increase my salary after a year's trial. Nearly three years had passed when I first ventured to remind the king of this promise. To my astonishment, he bluntly informed me that I had not given satisfaction, that I was difficult and unmanageable, more careful about what was right and what was wrong than for the obedience and submission. And as to salary, he, con he continued, Why you should be poor, you came into my presence every day with some petition, some case of hardship or injustice, and you demand your majesty shall most kindly investigate and cause redress to be made and I have granted to you, because you are important to me for translations, and so forth. And now you declare you must have increase of salary. Must you have everything in this world? Why you do not make them pay you? If I grant you all your petition for the poor, you ought to be rich, or you have no wisdom. At a loss what answer to make to this very unsympathetic view of my conduct, I quietly returned to my duties which grew daily in variety and responsibility. What with translating, correcting, copying, dictating, reading, I had hardly a moment I could call my own, and if at any time I rebelled, I brought down swift vengeance on the head of the helpless native secretary. But it was my consolation to know that I could befriend the women and children of the palace, who, when they saw that I was not afraid to oppose the king, in his more outrageous caprices of tyranny, imagined me endued with supernatural powers, and secretly came to me with their grievances, in full assurance that sooner or later I would see them redressed. And so, with no intention on my part, and almost without my own consent, I suffered myself to be set up between the oppressor and the oppressed. From that time I had no peace, 
Day after day I was called upon to resist the wanton cruelty of judges and magistrates, till at last I found myself at void with the whole San Luang. In cases of torture, imprisonment, extortion, I tried again and again to excuse myself from interfering, but still the mothers or sisters prevailed, and I had no choice left but to try to help them. Sometimes I sent boy with my clients, sometimes I went myself, and in no single instance was justice granted from a sense of right, but always through fear of my supposed influence with the king. My Siamese and European friends said I was amassing with fortune. It seemed not worth my while to contradict them, though the inference was painful to me, for in truth my championship was not purely disinterested. I suffered from continual contact with the sufferings of others, and came to the rescue in self-defense, and in pity for myself, not less than for them. A Chinaman had been cruelly murdered and robbed by a favorite slave in the household of the prime minister's brother, leaving the brother, wife, and children of the victim in helpless poverty and terror. The murderers had screened himself and his accomplices by sharing the plunder with the master. The widow cried for redress in vain. The ears of magistrates were stopped against her, and she was too poor to pay her way. But still she went from one court to another, until her importunity irritated the judges, who, to intimidate her, seized her eldest son on some monstrous pretext, and cast him into prison. This double cruelty completed the despair of the happy mother. She came to me fairly frenzied, and commanded me to go at once into the presence of the king, and demand her stolen child. And then, in a sudden paroxysm of grief, she embraced my knees, wailing and praying to me to help her. It was not in human nature to reject that maternal claim. With no little trouble I procured the liberation of her son, but to keep him out of harm's way, I had to take him into my own home and change his name. I called him Timothy, which by a Chinese abbreviation became T. When I went with this woman and the brother of the murdered man to the palace of the premier, we found that distinguished personage half-naked and playing chess. Seeing me enter, he ordered one of his slaves to bring him a jacket into which he thrust his arms, and went on with the game, and not until that was finished did he attend to me. When I explained my errand, he seemed vexed, but sent for his brother, had a long talk with him, and concluded by warning my unhappy protégés that if he heard any more complaints from them, they should be flogged. Then turning to me with a grim smile, he said, "'Chinese too much bother. Good-bye, sir.' This surprised me exceedingly, for I had often known the premier to award justice in spite of the king. That same evening, as I sat alone in my drawing-room, making notes as was my custom, I heard a slight noise, as of was someone in the room. Looking round, I saw, to my amazement, one of the inferior judges of the prime minister's court crouching by the piano. I asked how he dared to enter my house unannounced. Ma'am, said he, your servants admitted me. They know from whom I come, and would not venture to refuse me. And now it is for you to know that I am here from His Excellency Cho Fia Kralahomi, to request you to send in your resignation at the end of this month. By what authority does he send me this message? I asked. I know not, but it were best that you obey. Tell him. I replied, unable to control my anger, at the cowardly trick to intimidate me. I shall leave Siam when I please, and that no man shall set the time for me. The man departed, cringing and crouching, and excusing himself. This was the same wretch at whose instigation poor Munshi had been so shamefully beaten. I did not close my eyes that night. Again and again prudence advised me to seek safety in flight but the argument ended in my turning my back on the timid monitor and resolving to stay. About three weeks after this occurrence, His Majesty was going on an excursion up-country, and as he wished me to accompany my pupils, the Prime Minister was required 
to prepare a cabin for me and my boy on his steamer, the Volant. Before we left the palace, one of my anxious friends made me promise her that I would partake of no food nor taste a drop of wine on board the steamer, an injunction in the sequel easy to fulfill, as our wants were amply provided for at the Grand Palace, where we spent the whole day. But I cite this incident to show the state of mind which led me to prolong my stay, hateful as it had become. After this, affairs in the royal household went smoothly enough for some time, but still my tasks increased, and my health began to fail. When I informed His Majesty that I needed at least a month of rest, and that I thought of making a trip to Singapore, he was so unwilling that I should rate highly the services I rendered him, that he was careful to assure me I had not favoured him in any way, nor given him satisfaction, and that if I must be idle for a month, he certainly should not pay me for the time, and he kept his word. Nevertheless, while I was at Singapore, he wrote me to me most kindly, assuring me that his wives and children were anxious for my return. After the sad death of the dear little princess, Chao Fa Ying, the king had become more cordial, but the labor he imposed upon me was in proportion to the confidence he reposed in me. At times he required of me services, in my capacity of secretary, not to be thought of by a European sovereign, and when I declined to perform them, he would curse me, close the gates of the palace against me, and even subject me to the insults and threats of the parasites and slaves who crawled about his feet. On two occasions, first for refusing to write a false letter to Sir John Bowring, now plenipotentiary for the court of Siam in England, and again for declining to address the Earl of Clarendon in relation to a certain British officer then in Siam, he threatened to have me tried at the British consulate, and was so violent that I was in real fear for my life. For three days I waited, with doors and windows barred, for I knew not what explosion. After the death of the second king, his majesty behaved very disgracefully. It was well known that the ladies of the prince's harem were of the most beautiful of the women of Laos, Pegu, and Birma. Above all, the princess of Ching Mai was famed for her manifold graces of person and character. Etiquette forbade the royal brothers to pry into the constitution of each other's serail, but by means most unworthy of his station, and regardless of the privilege of his brother, Maha Mongkut had learned of the acquisition to the subordinate king's establishment of this celebrated and coveted beauty, and although she was now his legitimate sister-in-law, privately married to the prince, he was not restrained by any scruple of morality or delicacy, from manifesting his jealousy and pique. Moreover, this disgraceful feeling was fostered by other considerations than those of mere sensuality or ostentation. Her father, the tributary ruler of Chiang Mai, had on several occasions confronted his aggressive authority with a haughty and intrepid spirit, and once, when Maha Mongkut required that he should send his eldest son to Bangkok as a hostage, for the father's loyalty and good conduct. The unterrified chief replied that he would be his own hostage. On the summons being repeated in imperative terms, the young prince fled from his father's court and took refuge with the second king in his stronghold of Ban Sita, where he was most courteously received and entertained until he found it expedient to seek some securer or less compromising place of refuge. The friendship thus founded between two proud and daring princes soon became strong and enduring, and resulted in the marriage of the princess Sonarta Vismita, very willingly on her part, to the second king, about a year before his death. The son of the king of Chiang Mai never made his appearance at the court of Siam, but the stout old chief, attended by trusty followers, boldly brought his own hostage thither, and Maha Mongkut, though secretly chafing, accepted the situation with a show of graciousness, and overlooked the absence of the younger vassal. With the remembrance of these floatings still galling him, the supreme king frequently repaired to the second king's palace 
on the pretext of arranging certain family affairs entrusted to him by his late brother, but in reality to acquaint himself with the charms of several female members of the prince's household, and scandalous as it should have seemed, even to Siamese notions of the divine right of kings, the most attractive and accomplished of those women were quietly transferred to his own harem. For some time I heard nothing more of the princess of Ching Mai, but it was curious, even amusing, to observe the serene contempt with which the interlopers were received by the rival incumbents of the royal gynecium, especially the Laotian women, who are of a finer type and much handsomer than their Siamese sisters. Meantime, his majesty took up his abode for a fortnight at the second king's palace, thereby provoking dangerous gossip in his own establishment, so that his head-wife, the lady Siang, even made bold to hint that he might come to the fate of his brother and die by slow poison. His harem was agitated and excited throughout, some of the women abandoning themselves to unaccustomed and unnatural gaiety, while others sent their confidential slaves to consult the astrologers and soothsayers of the court, and by the aid of significant glances and shrugging of shoulders, and interchange of signs and whispers, with feminine telegraphy and secret service, most of those interested arrived at the sage conclusion that their lord had fallen under the spells of a witch or enchantress. Such was the domestic situation when his majesty suddenly and without warning returned to his palace, but in a mood so perplexing as to surpass all precedent and baffle all tact. I had for some time performed with surprising success a leading part in a pretty little court play, of which the well-meant plot had been devised by the Lady Theung. Whenever the king should be dangerously enraged, and ready to let loose upon some tender culprit of the harem, the monstrous lash or chain, I, at a secret cue from the head-wife, was to enter upon his majesty, book in hand, to consult his infallibility in a pressing predicament of translation into Sanskrit, Siamese, or English. Absurdly transparent as it was, perhaps the happier for its very childishness, under cover of this naive device, from time to time a hapless girl escaped of the fatal burst of his wrath. Midway in the rising storm of curses and abuse, he would turn with comical abruptness to the attractive interruption, with all the zest of a scholar. I often trembled, lest he should see through the thinly covered trick, but he never did. On his return from the prince's palace, however, even this innocent stratagem failed us, and on one occasion of my having recourse to it, he peremptorily ordered me away, and forbade my coming into his presence again, unless sent for. Daily after this, one or more of the women suffered from his pretty tyranny, cruelty, and spite. On every hand I heard sighs and sobs from young and old, and not a woman there but believed he was bewitched and beside himself. I had struggled through many exacting tasks since I came to Siam, but never any that so taxed my powers of endurance as my duties at this time in my double office of governess and private secretary to his majesty. His moods were so fickle and unjust, his temper so tyrannical, that it seemed impossible to please him. From one hour to another I never knew what to expect, and yet he persevered in his studies, especially in his English correspondence, which was ever his solace, his pleasure, and his pride. To an interested observer it might have afforded rare entertainment to note how fluently, though oddly, he spoke and wrote in a foreign language, but for his caprices, which at times were so ridiculous, however, as to be scarcely disagreeable, he would indict letters, sign them, affix his seal, and despatch them in his own mail-bags to Europe, America, or elsewhere, and months afterward insist on my writing to the parties addressed, to say that the instructions they contained were my mistake, errors of translation, transcription, anything but his intention. In one or two instances, finding 
that the case really admitted of explanation or apology from His Majesty, I slyly so worded my letter, that without compromising him, I yet managed to repair the mischief he had done. But I felt this could not continue long. Always, on foreign mail days, I spent from eight to ten hours in this most delicate and vexatious work. At length the crash came. The king had promised to Sir John Bowering the appointment of plenipotentiary to the court of France, to negotiate, on behalf of Siam, new treaties concerning the Cambodian possessions. With characteristic irresolution he changed his mind, and decided to send a Siamese embassy, headed by his lordship Phra Nan Wu, now known as His Excellency Chow Phra Sri Suri Wong Si. No sooner had he entertained this fancy, that he sent for me, and coolly directed me to write and explain the matter to Sir John, if possible attributing his new views and purpose to the advice of Her Britannic Majesty's Consul. Or, if I had scruples on that head, I might say the advice was my own, or anything I liked, so that I justified his conduct. At this distance of time I cannot clearly recall all the effect upon my feelings of so outrageous a proposition, but I do remember that I found myself emphatically declining to do anything of the kind. Then, warned by his gathering rage, I added that I would express to Sir John His Majesty's regrets, but to attribute the blame to those who had had no part in the matter, that I could never do. At this his fury was grotesque. His talent for invective was always formidable, and he tried to overpower me with threats. But a kindred spirit of resistance was aroused in me. I withdrew from the palace, and patiently abided the issue, resolved in my any event to be firm. His Majesty's anger was without bounds, and in the interval so fraught with anxiety and apprehension to me, when I knew that a considerable party in the palace, judges, magistrates, and officers about the person of the king, regarded me as an eminently proper person to behead or drown, he condescended to accuse me of abstracting a book that he chanced just then to miss from his library, and also of honoring and favoring the British consul at the expense of his American colleague, then resident at Bangkok. In support of the latter charge, he alleged that I had written the American consul's name at the bottom of a royal circular, after carefully displaying my own and the British functionaries at the top of it. The circular in question, which had given just umbrage to the American official, was fortunately in the keeping of the Honorable, footnote, here the title is Siamese, Mr. Bush, and was written by the king's own hand, as was well known to all whom it concerned. These charges, with others of a more frivolous nature, such as disobeying, thwarting, scolding his majesty, treating him with disrespect, as by standing while he was seated, thinking evil of him, slandering him, and calling him wicked, the king caused to be reduced to writing and sent to me, with an intimation that I must forthwith acknowledge my ingratitude and guilt, and make atonement my prompt compliance with his wishes." The secretary who brought the document to my house was accompanied by a number of the female slaves of the palace, who besought me, in the name of their mistresses, the wives of the Celestial Supreme, to yield, and do all that might be required of me. Seeing this shaft missed its mark, the secretary, being a man of resources, produced the other string to his bow. He offered to bribe me, and actually spent two hours in that respectable business, but finally departed in despair, convinced that the amount was inadequate to the cupidity of an insatiable European, and mourning for himself that he must return discomfited to the king. Next morning my boy and I presented ourselves as usual at the inner gate of the palace leading to the school, and were confronted there by a party of rude fellows and soldiers, who thrust us back with threats, and even took up stones to throw at us. I dare not think what might have been our fate, but for the generous rescue of a crowd of the poorest slaves, 
who at that hour were waiting for the opening of the gate. These rallied round us, and guarded us back to our home. It was indeed a time of terror for us. I felt that my life was in great danger, and so difficult did I find it to prevent the continual intrusion of the rabble, both men and women, into my house, that I had at length to bar my doors and windows, and have double locks and fastenings added. I became nervous and excited, as I had never been before. My first impulse was to write to the British consul and invoke his protection, but that looked covertly. Nevertheless, I did prepare the letter, ready to be dispatched at the first attempt upon our lives or liberty. I wrote also to Mr. Bush, asking him to find without delay the obnoxious circular and bring it to my house. He came that very evening, the paper in his hand. With infinite difficulty I persuaded the native secretary, whom I had again and again befriended, in like extremities, to procure for him an audience with the king. On coming into the presence of his majesty, Mr. Bush simply handed him the circular, saying, "'Ma'am tells me you wish to see this.' The moment the caption of the document met his eye, his majesty's countenance assumed a blank, bewildered expression peculiar to it, and he seemed to look to my friend for an explanation. But that gentleman had none to offer, for I had made none to him. And to crown all, even as the king was pointing to his brow to signify that he had forgotten having written it, one of the little princesses came crouching and crawling into the room with the missing volume in her hand. It had been found in one of the numerous sleeping apartments of the king, beside his pillow, just in time. Mr. Bush soon returned, bringing me assurances of His Majesty's cordial reconciliation, but I still doubted his sincerity, and for weeks did not offer to enter the palace. When, however, on the arrival of the Chow Phya steamer with the mail, I was formally summoned by the king to return to my duties, I quietly obeyed, making no allusion to my bygones. As I sat at my familiar table, copying, His Majesty approached and addressed me in these words. "'Ma'am, you are one great difficulty. I have much pleasure and favor in you, but you are too obstinate. You are not wise. Wherefore are you so difficult? You are only a woman. It is very bad you can be so strong-headed. Will you now have any objection to write to Sir John and tell him I am his very good friend?' "'None whatever,' I replied, "'if it is to be simply a letter of good wishes "'on the part of your majesty.' "'I wrote the letter and handed it to him for perusal. "'He was hardly satisfied, "'for with only a significant grunt he returned it to me "'and left the apartment at once, "'to vent his spite on someone "'who had nothing to do with the matter. "'In due time the following very considerate "'but significant reply addressed to His Majesty's one great difficulty, was received from Sir John Bowring. Claremont, Exeter, 30th June, 1867. Dear Madame, Your letter of 12th May demands from me the attention of a courteous reply. I am quite sure the ancient friendship of the King of Siam would never allow a slight, or indeed an unkindness to me, and I hope to have opportunities of showing His Majesty that I feel a deep interest in his welfare. As regards the diplomacy of European courts, it is but natural that those associated with them should be more at home, and better able to direct their course, than strangers from a distance, however personally estimable. And though, in the case in question, the mission of a Siamese ambassador to Paris was no doubt well intended, and could never have been meant to give me annoyance. It was not to be expected he would be placed in that position of free and confidential intercourse, which my long acquaintance with public life would enable me to occupy. In remote regions, people with little knowledge of official matters, in high quarters, often take upon themselves to give advice, in great ignorance of facts, and speak very unadvisably, on topics on which their opinions are worthless, and their influence valueless. 
as regards M. Albaret's offensive proceedings. I doubt not he has received a caution. Footnote, Albaret, French consul at Bangkok, whose overbearing conduct has been described elsewhere. End of footnote. On my representation, and that he, and others of his nation, would not be very willing that the emperor, an old acquaintance of mine, should hear from my lips what I might have to say. The will of the emperor is supreme, and I am afraid the Cambodian question is now referred back to Siam. It might have been better for me to have discussed it with his imperial majesty. However, the past is past. Personal influence, as you are aware, is not transferable. But when by the proper powers I am placed in a position to act, his majesty may be assured, as I have assured himself, that his interests will not suffer in my hands. I am obliged to you for the manner in which you have conveyed to me his majesty's gracious expressions. And you will believe me to be yours very truly, John Bowring. No friend of mine knew at that time how hard it was for me to bear up in the utter loneliness and forlornness of my life, under the load of cares and provocations and fears that gradually accumulated upon me. But, ah, if any germ of love and truth fell from my heart into the heart of even the meanest of those wives and concubines and children of a king, if by any word of mine the least of them was wont to look up out of the depths of their miserable life to a higher, clearer, brighter light than their Buddha casts upon their path, then indeed I did not labor in vain among them. In the summer of 1866 my health suddenly broke down, and for a time it was thought that I must die. When good Dr. Campbell gave me the solemn warning, all my troubles seemed to cease, and but for one sharp pang for my children, one in England, the other in Siam, I should have derived pure and perfect pleasure from the prospect of eternal rest, so weary was I of the tumultuous life in the East, and though in the end I regained my strength in a measure, I was no longer able to comply with the pitiless exactions of the king, and so, yielding to the urgent entreaties of my friends, I decided to return to England. It took me half a year to get His Majesty's consent, and it was not without tiresome accusations of ingratitude and idleness that he granted me leave of absence for six months. I had hardly courage to face the women and children the day I told them I was going away. It was hard to be with them, but it seemed cowardly to leave them. For some time most of them refused to believe that I was really going, but when they could doubt no longer, they displayed the most touching tenderness and thoughtfulness. Many sent me small sums of money to help me on the journey. The poorest and meanest slaves brought me rice cakes, dried beans, coconuts, and sugar. It was in vain that I assured them I could not carry such things away with me. Still the supplies poured in. The king himself, who had been silent and sullen until the morning of my departure, relented when the time came to say good-bye. He embraced Boy with cordial kindness, and gave him a silver buckle, and a bag containing a hundred dollars, to buy sweetmeats on the way. Then turning to me, he said, as if forgetting himself, Ma'am, you much beloved by our common people, and all inhabitants of palace and royal children, every one is an affliction of your departure and even that opium-eating secretary, Fra Alak, is very low down in his heart, because you will go. It shall be because you must be a good and true lady. I am often angry in you, and lose my temper, though I have large respect for you. But nevertheless you ought to know you are a difficult woman, and more difficult than generality. But you will forget, and come back to my service, for I have more confidence on you every day. Goodbye. I could not reply. My eyes filled with tears. Then came the parting with my pupils, the women and the children. That was painful enough, even while the king was present. But when he abruptly withdrew, great was the uproar. What could I do 
but stand still and submit to kisses, embraces, reproaches, from princesses and slaves. At last I rushed through the gate, the woman screaming after me, Come back, and the children, Don't go. I hurried to the residence of the heir apparent, to the most trying scene of all. His regret seemed too deep for words, and the few he did utter were very touching. Taking both my hands and laying his brow upon them, he said, after a long interval of silence, Mam cha club mat hort. Mam dear, come back, please. Keep a brave and true heart, my prince, was all that I could say, and my last, God bless you, was addressed to the royal palace of Siam. To this young prince, Chofa Chula Longkorn, I was strongly attached. He often deplored with me the cruelty with which the slaves were treated, and young as he was, did much to inculcate kindness towards them among his immediate attendants. He was a conscientious lad, of pensive habit and gentle temper. Many of my poor clients I bequeathed to his care, particularly the Chinese lad T., Speaking of slavery one day, he said to me, These are not slaves, but nobles. They know how to bear. It is we, the princes, who have yet to learn which is the most noble, the oppressor or the oppressed. When I left the palace, the king was fast failing in body and mind, and in spite of his seeming vigor, there was no real health in his rule, while he had his own way. All the substantial success we find in his administration is due to the ability and energy of his accomplished premier, Fiacra Lolohome, and even his strength has been wasted. The native arts and literature have retrograded, in the mechanical arts much has been lost, and the whole nation is given up to gambling. The capacity of the Siamese race for improvement in any direction has been sufficiently demonstrated, and the government has made fair progress in political and moral reforms, but the condition of the slaves is such as to excite astonishment and horror. What may be the ultimate fate of Siam under this accursed system, whether she will ever emancipate herself while the world lasts, there is no question. The happy examples free intercourse affords, the influence of European ideas, and the compulsion of public opinions may yet work wonders. On the 5th of July, 1867, we left Bangkok in the steamer Chao Phya. All our European friends accompanied us to the Gulf of Siam, where we parted, with much regret on my side, and of all those whose kindness and bravely cheered us during our long, I am tempted to write, captivity, the last to bid us Godspeed, was the good Captain Orton, to whom I hear tender my heartfelt thanks. End of chapter 27This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Kingdom of Siam With her despotic ruler, priest and king, her religion of contradictions, at once pure and corrupt, lovely and cruel, ennobling and debasing, her laws, wherein wisdom is so perversely blended, with blindness, enlightenment with barbarism, strength with weakness, justice with oppression, her profound scrutiny into mystic forms of philosophy, her ancient culture of physics, borrowed from the primitive speculations of Brahminism. Siam is, beyond a peradventure, one of the most remarkable and thought-compelling of the empires of the Orient, a fascinating and provoking enigma alike to the theologian and the political economist. Like a troubled dream, delirious in contrast with the coherence and stability of Western life, the land and its people, 
seemed to be conjured out of a secret of darkness, a wonder to the senses and a mystery to the mind. And yet it is a strangely beautiful reality. The enchanting variety of its scenery, joined to the inexhaustible productiveness of its soil, constitutes a challenge to the charms of every other region, except perhaps the country watered by the great river of China. Through an immense, continuous level of unfailing fertility, the Mainam rolls slowly, reposefully, grandly, in its course, receiving draughts from many a lesser stream, filling many a useful canal in its turn, and from the abundance the generous rains bestow, distributing supplies of refreshment and fatness to innumerable acres. In a soil at once so rich and so well watered, the sun, with its vivifying heats, engenders a mighty vegetation, delighting the eye for more than half the year with endless undulations of grain and a great golden Eden of fruit. Its staples are solid blessings, rice, the ascetic stuff of life, sugar, most popular of dietic luxuries, indigo, most valuable of dyes, in the drier tracts, cotton, tobacco, coffee, a variety of palms, from one species of which sugar, not unlike that of the maple, is extracted, the wild olive and the fig. Then there are vast forests of teak, that enduring monarch of the vegetable kingdom, ebony, satin wood, eagle wood, beside ivory, beeswax and honey, raw silk, and many aromatic gums and fragrant spices. And though the scenery is less various and picturesque than that of the regions of Gangetic India, where ranges of noble mountains make the land majestic, nevertheless nature riots here in bewildering luxuriances of vegetable forms and colors. Vast tracts, shady and cool, with dense dark foliage, trees, tall and strong, spreading their giant arms abroad, with prickly, shining shrubs between, while parasites and creepers, wild, bright, and beautiful, trail from the highest boughs to the ground. The bamboo, shooting to the height of sixty feet and upward, with branches gracefully drooping. The generous kind banana, fairy forests of firms of a thousand forms, tall grasses, with their pale and plumy blossoms, the many-trunked and many-rooted banyan, the bow sacred to Buddha, all combine to form a garden that Adam might have dressed and kept, and only Eve could spoil. It is only when he approaches the borders of the land that the traveller is greeted by grand mountains, crowned with impenetrable forests, and forming an amphitheatre around the graceful plains. Along the coast the view is more diversified, islands the most picturesque and rich with diversified vegetation make happy striking contrasts here and there with the deep blue sea around them. The extent and boundaries of the kingdom and its dependencies have been variously described, but according to the statement of His Majesty Maha Mongkut, the dominion of his predecessors, before the possession of Malacca by the Portuguese, extended over the whole of the Malayan peninsula, including the islands of Singapore and Pinang, which at that time formed a part of the realm of the Raja of Quedah, who still pays tribute to the crown of Siam. It was at the instigation of English settlers that the states of Johor, Singapore, Rambo, Talangor, Pahang, and Pua became subject to British rule, so that today the Siamese dominion, starting from the little kingdom of Tringamu, extends from the fourth to the twenty-second degree of north latitude, giving about 1,350 miles of length, while from east to west its greatest breadth is about 450 miles. On the north it is bounded by several provinces of Laos, tributaries of Ava and China, on the east by the empire of Anam, on the west by the sea and British possessions, on the south by the petty states of Pahang and Pua. Beyond Siam, proper are the kingdom of Ligor and the four small states, Quedah, Patan, Kalantan, and Yinagana. On the east, a part of the kingdom of Cambodia, Mong Korat, 
and several provinces of Laos. On the north, the kingdoms of Chiang Mai, Laphun, Lakhon, Mong Phie, Mang Naun, Muang Lon, and Luang Phrabang. The great plain of Siam is bounded on the east by a spur of the Himalayan range, which breaks off in Cambodia, and is found again in the west, extending almost to the extremity of the Malayan states. On the north, these two mountain ranges approach each other, and form that multitude of small hills which imparts so picturesque an aspect to the Laos country. This plain is watered by the river Mainam, footnote, mother of waters, a common Siamese term for all large streams, end of footnote, or Chow Phya, whose innumerable branches, great and small, and the many canals which fed by it, intersect the capital in all directions, constitute it the high road of the empire. For many miles its banks are fringed with the graceful bamboo, the tamarind, the palm, and the people, the homes of myriads of birds of the land and of the water, creatures of brilliant plumage and delightful song. Siam has some excellent harbors, though the principal one, on the gulf, is partially obstructed by great banks of sand that have accumulated at the mouth of Jofia. Ships of ordinary burden, however, can cross these banks at high tide, and in a few hours cast anchor in the heart of the capital, in from sixty to seventy feet of water. Here they are snug and safe. Besides, the gulf itself is free from the typhoons, so destructive to shipping on the China seas. In all the Malayan islands there are numerous unimportant streams, which, though limited in their course, form excellent harbors at their debouchment on the coast. The eastern regions of Laos and Cambodia are watered by the river Mekong, which has a course of nearly a thousand miles, but its navigation, like that of the Mainam at its mouth, is impeded by sandbanks. The smaller streams, Chantabun, Petru, and Tha Chang, all run into the Mekong, which, mingling its waters with those of the Mainam, flows through Chiang Mai, receives the waters of Pizza Lok, and then, diverging by many channels, inundates the great plain of Siam once every year in the months of June. By the end of August, this entire region has become one vast sheet of water, so that boats traverse it in every direction, without injury to the young rice springing up beneath them. The climate of Siam is more or less hot according to the latitude. Only continual bathing can render it endurable. There are but two seasons, the wet and the dry. As soon as the southwest monsoon sets in, masses of spongy cumuli gather on the summits of the western mountains, giving rise to the furious squalls about sunset, and dispersing in peals of thunder and torrents of refreshing rain. From the beginning to the end of the rainy season, this succession of phenomena is repeated every evening. The monsoon from the north brings an excess of rain, and the thermometer falls. With the return of the dry season, the air becomes comparatively cool and most favorable to health. This continues from October to January. The dews are extremely heavy in the months of March and April. At dawn, the atmosphere is impregnated with a thick fog, which, as the sun rises, descends in dews so abundant that trees, plants, and grass drip as from a recent shower of rain. The population of Siam is still a matter of uncertainty, but it is officially estimated at from six to seven millions of souls, comprising Siamese or Thai Malay, Laotians, Cambodians, Pejans, Karians, Shans, and Loas. Siam produces enormous quantities of excellent rice, of which there are forty distinct varieties, and her sugar is esteemed the best in the world. Her rivers and lakes abound in fish, as well as in turtles and aquatic birds. The exports are rice, sugar, cotton, tobacco, hemp, kutch, fish, salted and dried, coconut oil, beeswax, 
dried fruits, gamboge, cardamons, betel nuts, pepper, various gums and barks, sapon wood, eagle wood, rosewood, crushy wood, ebony, ivory, raw silk, buffalo hides, tiger skins, armadillo skins, elephants' tusks and bones, rhinoceros bones, turtle shells, peacock's tails, birds' nests, kingfishers' feathers, etc. The revenue arising from duties and tolls on imported and native produce being mostly collected in kind, only a small part is converted into specie. The rest is distributed in part payment of salaries to the dependents of the court, whose name is legion. Princes of the blood royal, high officers of state, provincial governors and most of the judges, receive grants of provinces, districts, villages and farms, to support their several dignities and reward their services. And the rents, fees, fines, bribes and sops of these assignments are collected by them for their own behoof. Thus, to one man are given the fees, to another the fines or bribes, which custom has attached to his functions. To others are allotted offices, by virtue of which certain imposts are levied. To this man the land, to another the waters of rivers and canals, to a third the fruit-bearing trees. But money is distributed with a niggard hand, and only once a year. Every officer of revenue is permitted to pocket, and charge to salary, a part of all that he collects in taxes, fines, extortions, bribes, gifts, and testimonials. The rulers of Laos pay to the crown of Siam a tribute of gold and silver trees, rings set with gems and chains of solid gold. The trees, which appear to be composed entirely of the precious metals, are really nothing more than cylinders and tubes of tin, substantially gilt or plated, designed to represent the graceful clove tree, indigenous to that part of the country. The leaves and blossoms, however, are of solid gold and silver. Each tree is planted in an artificial gilt mound, and is worth from five hundred to seven hundred tikals, while the chains and rings are decorated with large and pure rubies. The raw silk, elephant's tusks, and other rare products of Siam, are highly prized by the Mohammedan traders, who compete one with another in shipping them from the Bombay markets. They are usually put up at auction, and strange to say, the auctioneers are women of the royal harem, the favorite concubines of the first king. The shrewd Muslim broker, turning a longing eye upon the precious stores of the royal warehouses, employs his wife, or a trusty slave, to approach this Nornmahal, or that rose in bloom with presents, and promises of generous premium to her, whose influence shall procure for the bidder the acceptance of his proposal. By a system of secret service, peculiar to these traders, the amount of the last offer is easily discovered, and the new bidder sees that, if I may be permitted to amuse myself with the phraseology of the Mississippi bluff player, and goes a few tickles better. There are always several enterprising stars of the harem ready to vary the monotony by engaging in this unromantic business, and the agitation among the sealed sisterhood, though by no means boisterous, is lively, though all have tact to appear indifferent in the presence of their awful lord. The meagerness of the royal allowance of pin-money is the consideration that renders the prize important in the eyes of each of the competitors. And yet it is strange, in all the feminine vanity and vexation of spirit, that the occasion engenders how little of jealous bitterness and hurt burning is directed against the lucky lady. The competitors agree upon a favorable opportunity to present the tenders of their respective clients to his majesty, each selecting the most costly and attractive of her bribes, and displaying them to advantage on a tray of gold, lays the written bid on the top, or with a shrewd device of the maternal instinct, so fertile in pretty tricks of artfulness, places it in the hands of a pet child, who is taught to present it winningly as the king descends to his midday meal. 
the attention of his majesty is attracted by the display of showy toys. He deigns to inquire as to the donors. The sealed proposals are respectfully, and doubtless with more or less coquetry, pressed upon him, and the matter is then and there concluded, almost invariably in favor of the highest bidder. This semi-romantic mode of traffic was gravely encouraged by his late majesty, for the benefit of his favorites of the harem, and great store of produce, of the finer varieties, was thus disposed of in the palace. The poll tax of the Chinese, levied once in three years, is paid in bullion. The annual income of the public treasury rarely exceeds the outgo, but whatever the state of the exchequer, and of the funds reserved for the service of the state, the personal resources of the monarch are always most abundant. Nor do the great sums lavished upon his favorites and children deplete, in any respect, his vast treasures, because they are all supported by grants of land, monopolies of market, special taxes, tithes, docours, and other patrimonial or tributary provisions. A certain emolument is also derived from the valuable mines of the country, though poorly worked as they are, but small importance has as yet been ascribed to these as a source of revenue. Yet the gold of Bang Tapan is esteemed the purest and most ductile in the world. Beside mines of iron, antimony, gold, and silver, there are quarries of white marble. The extraordinary number of idols and works of art, cast in metal, seems to indicate that these mines were once largely worked, and it is believed that the vast quantities of gold, which for centuries has been consumed in the construction of images and the adornment of temples, pagodas, and palaces, were drawn from them. The country abounds in pits, bearing marks of great age, and there are also remains of many furnaces, which are said to have been abandoned in the wars with Pegu. Mineral springs, copious and, no doubt, valuable, are numerous in some parts of the country. The exports of Siam are various and profitable, and of the raw materials, teak timber is entitled to the first consideration. The domestic consumption of this most useful wood in the construction of dwellings, sacred edifices, ships, and boats, is enormous. Yet the forests traversed by the great rivers seem inexhaustible, and the supply continues so abundant that the variations in the price are very slight. The advantage the country must derive from her extensive commerce in a commodity so valuable may hardly be overrated. Next in importance are the native sugars, rice, cotton, and silk, which find their way in large quantities to the markets of China and Hindustan. Among other articles of crude produce may be mentioned ivory, footnote, in Siam reserved as a royal appropriation, end of footnote, a single fine tusk being often valued at five thousand dollars, wax, lead, copper, tin, amber, indigo, tobacco, honey, and bird's nests. There are also precious stones of several varieties, and the famous gold of Bang Tapan. Forty different kinds of rice are named, but these may properly be reduced to four classes, the common or table, the small grain or mountain, the glutinous, and the vermilion rice. From the glutinous rice, arak is distilled. The areca, or pinang nut, and the betel are used almost universally, chewed with lime, the lime being dyed with turmeric, which imparts to it a rich vermilion tint. The areca nut is also used in dyeing cotton thread. The characteristic traits of the Siamese court are hauteure, insolent indifference and ostentation, the natural features and expression of tyranny, and every artifice, that power and opulence can devise, is employed to inspire the minds of the common people with trembling awe and devout veneration for their sovereign master. Though the late supreme king wisely reformed certain of the stunning customs of the court with more modest innovations, nevertheless 
he rarely went abroad without extravagant display, especially in his annual visitations to the temples. These were performed in a style studiously contrived to strike the beholder with astonishment and admiration. The royal state barge, one hundred cubits long, beside being elaborately carved and inlaid with bits of crystal, porcelain, mother-of-pearl, and jade, is richly enameled and gilt. The stem, which rises ten or eleven feet from the bows, represents the Nakha Mustakha Sapta, the seven-headed serpent or alligator. A Frasat, or elevated throne, also termed Fra the Nang, occupies the center, supported by four pillars. The extraordinary beauty of the inlaying of shells, mother of pearl, crystal, and precious stones of every color, the splendor of the gilding, and the elegance of the costly kink of curtains with which it is hung, combine to render this one of the most striking and beautiful objects to be seen of the Mainan. The barge is usually manned by one hundred and fifty men, their paddles gilt and silver tipped. This government reproduces, in many of its shows of power, pride, and ostentation, a tableau vivant of European rule in the darker ages, when, on the decline of Roman dominance, the principles of feudal dependence were established by barbarians from the north. Under such a system it is impossible to ascertain, or to represent by any standards of currency, the amount of the royal revenues and treasures. But it is known that the riches of the Siamese monarch are immense, and that a magnificent share of the legal plunder drawn into the royal treasury is sunk there, and never returns into circulation again. The hoarding of money seems to be the cherished practice of all Oriental rulers, and even a maxim of state policy, and that the general diffusion of property among his subjects offers the only safe assurance of prosperity for himself and stability for his throne in the last precept of prudence an Asiatic monarch ever learns. The armies of Siam are raised on the spur of the moment, as it were, for any pressing emergency. When troops are to be called out, a royal command, addressed to all viceroys and governors, requires them to raise their respective quotas, and report to a commander-in-chief at a general rendezvous. Those recruits are clothed, equipped with arms and ammunition, and subsisted with daily rations of rice, oil, etc., but are not otherwise paid. The small standing army, which serves as a nucleus upon which these irregulars are gathered and formed, consists of infantry, cavalry, elephant riders, archers, and private bodyguards, paid at the rate of from five to ten dollars a month, with clothing and rations. The infantry are armed with muskets and sabres, the cavalry with bows and arrows as well as spears, but the spear, which is from six to seven feet long, is the favorite weapon of this arm of the service, and they handle it with astonishing dexterity. The king's private bodyguards are well paid, closed and quartered, having their stations and barracks within the palace walls, and near the most attractive streets and avenues, while other troops are lodged outside. It is customary to detain the families of conscripts in the districts to which they belong, as prisoners on parole, hostages for the good conduct of their young men in the army, and for the desertion or treachery of the soldier, his wife or children, mother or sisters, as the case may be, are tortured or even executed, without compunction or remorse. The long and peaceful reign of the late king, however, has almost effaced from the minds of the youth of Siam the remembrance of such monstrous oppressions. The Siamese are but indifferent sailors, their nautical excursions being mainly confined to short coasting trips, or boating in safe and familiar channels. The more adventurous export trade is carried on almost wholly by foreigners. About one thousand war boats constitute the bulk of the navy. These are constructed from the solid bowl of the teak tree, excavated partly with fire, partly with the aids, 
and while they are commonly from eighty to a hundred feet long, the breadth rarely exceeds eight or nine feet, though the apparent width is increased by the addition of a sort of light gallery. They are made to carry fifty or sixty rowers, with short oars working on a pivot. The prow, which is solid, has a flat terrace, on which, for the king's up-country excursions, they mount a small field-piece, a nine- or a twelve-pounder. There are also several men-of-war belonging to the government, built by European engineers. The number of vessels in the merchant marine cannot be great. Dwelling so long in peace and security at home, the tastes and the energies of the Siamese people have been confirmed by their political circumstances, in that inclination toward agricultural rather than commercial pursuits, which their geographical conditions naturally engender. The extreme fertility of the soil, watered by innumerable streams, and intersected in every direction by a network of capacious canals, of which the Klong Yai, Klong Bangkok Noi, and Klong Phra Chadi are the most remarkable. The generating heats of the climate, the teeming plains of the upper provinces, bulwarked by mighty mountains, and above all that magnificent mother, the Meinam, winding in her beauty and bounty through a vast and lovely vale to the sea, in her course subjecting all things to the enriching and adorning influence of her touch, all combine by their irresistible inducements to determine the native to the tilling of the ground. Nothing can be more delightful than an excursion through the country immediately after the subsidence of the floods. Then nature is draped in hues, as charming as they are various, from the palest olive to the liveliest green. Broad fields wave with tall golden spires of grain, or are dotted with tufted sheaves, heavy with generous crops. The refreshed air is perfumed with the fragrance of the orange, lemon, citron, and other tropical fruits and flowers, and on every side the landscape is a scene of lovely meadows, alive with flocks and herds, and busy with herdsmen, husbandmen, and gardeners. The most considerable of the many canals by which communication is maintained with all parts of the country is Klong Yai, the Great Canal, supposed to have been begun in the reign of Ya Tak. It is nearly a hundred cubits deep, twenty Siamese fathoms broad, and forty miles long. Bangkok has been aptly styled the Venice of the Orient, for not only the villages, sickly studying the banks of the Mainan, but the remoter hamlets as well, even to the confines of the kingdom, have each its own canals. In fact, the lands annually inundated by the mother of waters are so extensive, and for the most part lie so low, and the number of water ducts, natural and artificial, is so great, that of all the torrents does that descend upon the country in the months of June, July, and August, when the whole land is a sea, in which towns and villages show like docks connected by drawbridges, with little islets between or groves of orchards, whose tops alone are visible, not a tithe ever returns to the ocean. The modern bridges of Siam, which are mostly of iron in the European style, are made to be drawn for the passage of the king's barge, since the royal head may not without desecration pass under anything trodden by the foot of man. The more ancient bridges, however, are of stone and brick, and here and there are strange artificial lakes, partly filled up with the debris of temples that once stood on their banks. Of roads there are but few that are good, and all are of comparatively recent construction. End of chapter 28「Chapter 29 of the English Governess at the Siamese Court by Anna H. Leonowens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ruins of Cambodia, an Excursion to the Nang Ho Kwat. Footnote. The Cambodian was, without doubt, in its day, 
one of the most powerful of the empires of the East. As to its antiquity, two opinions prevail, one ascribing to it a duration of one thousand and three hundred years, the other of two thousand four hundred. The native historians reckon two thousand four hundred years from the building of the Naghon Wat, or Naghon Onghur, but this computation, not agreeing with the mythological traditions of the country, which date from the year of the world two hundred and five, is not accepted as authentic by the more learned Cambodians. End of footnote. Our journey from Bangkok to Kabin derived its memorable interest from those features and feelings which join to compose the characteristic romance of eastern travel by unhackened ways. The wild freedom of a plain, the tortuous, suspicious mountain track, the tangled jungle, the bewildering wastes and glooms of an unexplored region, with their suggestions of peril and adventure, and especially that glorious participation in the enlargement and liberty of an eastern wanderer's life which these afford. Once you begin to feel that, you will be happy, whether on an elephant or in a buffalo cart, the very privations and perils including a charm of excitement, all unknown to the formal European tourist. The rainbow mists of morning still lay low on the plain, as yet unlifted by the breeze, that laden with odor and song gently rocked the higher branches in the forest, as our elephants pressed on, heavily but almost noiselessly, over a parchy-colored carpet of wild flowers. Strange birds darted from bough to bough, among the wild myrtles and limes, and great green and golden lizards gleamed through the shrubbery as we approached Siem Rap. The more extensive and remarkable ruins of Cambodia seem concentrated in this part of the country, though they are by no means confined to it, but are found widely scattered, over the neighboring territories. From Sisophon, we diverged in a northeasterly direction, and at evening found ourselves in the quaint, antique town of Phanop Sok, half ruined and deserted, where the remains of a magnificent palace can still be traced. The country between Cambodia and Siam is an inclined plain falling off to the sea, beginning from the Kho Don Reke, or highlands of Korat which constitutes the first platform of the terraces that gradually ascend to the mountain chain of Laos, and thence to the stupendous Himalayas. Khoa Don Reke, the mountain which bears on the shoulders, the Cambodian atlas, includes in its domain the Dong Phya Fei, forest of the Lord of Fire, whence many tributary streams flow into the beautiful Pahim River. At sunrise next morning, we resumed our journey, and after a long day of toiling through treacherous marshes and tangled brushwood, came at sunset upon an object, whose presence there was a wonder, and its past a puzzle. A ridge or embankment of ten or twelve feet elevation, which to our astonishment ran high and dry through the swampy lowlands. In the heart of an interminable forest, it stretches along one side of the tangled trail, in some places walling it in, at others crossing it at right angles. Now suddenly diving into the depths of the forest, now reappearing afar off, as if to mock our cautious progress, and invite us to follow it. The eye, wistfully pursuing its eccentric sweep, suddenly loses it in impenetrable shadows. There is not a vestige of any other ruin near it, and the long lines it here and there shows, ghostly white in the moonlight, seem like spectral strands of sand. Our guides tell us this isolated ridge was once the great highway of ancient Cambodia, that it can be traced from the neighborhood of Noh Buri to Nakhon Wat, and thence to the very heart of Cochin China, and one assures us that no man has ever seen the end of it. So on we went, winding our devious way over pastless ground, now diving into shady valleys, now mounting to sunny eminences, where the breeze blew free and the eye could range far and wide, but not to find aught that was human. Gradually the flowering shrubs forsook us, 
and dark forest trees pressed grimly around as we traversed the noble stone bridges that those grand old cambodians loved to build over comparatively insignificant streams the moon touching with fantastic light the crumbling arches and imparting a charm of illusion to the scene the clear sprangled sky the startling voices of the night and the influence of the unknown the mysterious and the weird overcame us like a dream truly there is naught of the commonplace or vulgar in this land of ruins and legends and the foretaste of the wonders we were about to behold met our view in the great bridges Tafan hen the stone bridge and the finer and more artistic Tafan hevada the angel's bridge are both imposing works arches still resting firmly on their foundations buttressed by fifty great pillars of stone support a structure about five hundred feet long and eighty broad the roadbed of these ridges is formed of immense blocks or beams of stone laid one upon another and so adjusted that their very weight serves to keep the arches firm in a clearing in the forest near a rivulet called by the cambodians Stieng sin sufficient to our need we encamped and having rested and supped again followed our guides over the foaming stream and recrossed the stone bridge on foot marvelling at the work of a race of whose existence the western nations know nothing who have no name in history yet who build it in a style surpassing in boldness of conception grandeur of proportions and delicacy of design the best works of the modern world stupendous beautiful enduring the material is mostly freestone but a flintly conglomerate appears wherever the work is exposed to the action of the water formerly a fine balustrade crowned the bridge on both sides but it has been broken down the ornamental parts of these massive structures seem to have been the only portions the invading vandals of the time could destroy the remains of the balustrade show that it consisted of a series of long quarry stones on the ridges of which caryatidian pillars representing the seven-headed serpent supported other slabs grooved along the rim to receive semi-convex stones with arabesque sculptures affording a hint of ancient cambodian art on the left bank we found the remains of a staircase leading down to the water not far from a spot where a temple formerly stood next morning we crossed the tafan tev or heavenly bridge like the tafan hen and the tafan tevada a work of almost superhuman magnitude and solidity leaving the bridges our native pilots turned off from the ancient causeway to grope through narrow miry paths into jungle on the afternoon of the same day we arrived at another stone bridge over the palang river this according to our guides was abandoned by the builders because the country was invaded by the hostile hordes who destroyed nakhon wat slowly crumbling along the wild plantains and the pagan lotuses and lilies these bridges seemed to constitute the sole memorial in the midst of that enchanting desolation of a once proud and populous capital from the palenga river limpid a cheerful a day's journey brought us to the town of simrap and after an unnecessary delay of several hours we started with lighter pockets for the ruins of nakhon wat nakhon or Ongkor, is supposed to have been the royal city of the ancient kingdom of cambodia or kaimain of which the only traditions that remain describe in wild extravagances its boundless territory its princes without number who paid tribute in gold silver and precious stuffs its army of seventy thousand war elephants two hundred thousand horsemen and nearly six millions of foot soldiers and its royal treasure houses covering three hundred miles of ground in the heart of this lonely region in a district still bearing the name of Ongkor, and quite apart from the ruined temples that abound hard by we found architectural remains of such exceeding grandeur with ruins of temples and palaces 
which must have been raised at so vast a cost of labor and treasure, that we were overwhelmed with astonishment and admiration. What manner of people were these? Whence came their civilization and their culture? And why and whither did they disappear from among the nations of the earth? The site of the city is in itself unique. Chosen originally for the strength of its position, it yet presents none of the features which should mark the metropolis of a powerful people. It seems to stand aloof from the world, exempt from its passions and aspirations, and shunning even its thrift. Confronting us with its towering portal, overlaid with colossal hieroglyphics, the majestic ruin of the Watt stands like a petrified dream of some Michelangelo of the giants, more impressive in its loneliness, more elegant and animated in its grace, than aught that Greece and home have left us, and addressing us with a significance all the sadder and more solemn for the desolation and barbarism which surround it. Unhappily, the shocks of war, seconding the slowly grinding mills of time, have left but few of these noble monuments, and slowly but ruthlessly, the work of destruction and decay goes on. Vainly may we seek for any chronicle of the long line of monarchs who must have swayed the scepter of the once powerful empire of Maha Nakhon. Only a vague tradition has come down, of a celestial prince to whom the fame of founding the great temple is supposed to belong, and of an Egyptian king who, for his sacrilege, was changed into a leper. An interesting statue representing the latter still stands in one of the corridors, somewhat mutilated but sufficiently well preserved to display a marked contrast to the physical type of the present race of Cambodians. The inscriptions with which some of the columns are covered are illegible, and if you question the natives as to the origin of Nakhon Wat, they will tell you that it was the work of the leper king, or of Phra in Sven, king of heaven, or of giants, or that it made itself. These magnificent edifices seem to have been designed for places of worship rather than of royal habitation, for nearly all are Buddhist temples. The statues and sculptures on the walls of the outer corridor are in alto relievo and generally life-size. The statue of the leper king, set up in a sort of pavilion, is moderately colossal, and is seated in a tranquil and noble attitude. The head especially is a masterpiece, the features being classic and of manly beauty. Approaching the temple of Angkor, the most beautiful and best preserved of these glorious remains, the traveller is compensated with full measure of wonder and delight for all the fatigues and hardships of his journey. Complete as is the desolation, a strange air of luxury hangs over all, as though the golden glow of sunshine amid the refreshing gloom were for the glory and the ease of kings. At each angle of the temple there are two enormous lions, hewn, pedestal, and all, from a single block. A flight of stone steps leads us up to the first platform of terraces. To reach the main entrance from the north staircase we traverse a noble causeway, which midway crosses a deep and wide moat that seems to surround the building. The main entrance is by a long gallery, having a superb central tower, with two others of less height on each side. The portico of each of the three principal towers is formed by four projecting columns, with a spacious staircase between. At either extremity are similar porticos, and beyond these is a very lofty door, or gateway, covered with gigantic hieroglyphs, where gods and warriors hang, as if self-supported between earth and sky. Then come groves of columns that in girth and height might rival the noblest oaks. Every pillar and every part of the wall is so crowded with sculptures that the whole temple seems hung with petrified tapestry. On the west side the long gallery is flanked 
by two rows of almost square columns. The blank windows are cut out of the wall and finished with stone railings or balconies of curiously twisted columns, and the different compartments are equally covered with sculptures of subjects taken from the Yaramayana. Here are Laksham and Hanuman leading their warriors against Ravana, some with ten heads, others with many arms. The monkeys are building the stone bridge over the sea. Rama is seen imploring the aid of the celestial protector, who sits on high, in grand and dreamy contemplation. Rama's father is challenging the enemy, while Ravana is engaged in combat with the leader of the many-wheeled chariots. There are many other figures of eight-handed deities, and all are represented with marvellous skill in grouping and action. The entire structure is roofed with tiers of hewn stone, which is also sculptured, and remains of a ceiling may still be traced. The symmetrical wings terminate in three spacious pavilions, and this imposing colonnade, which by its great length, height, and harmonious proportions, is conspicuous from a great distance, and forms an appropriate vestibule to so grand a temple. Traversing the building, we cross another and finer causeway, formed of great blocks of stone carefully joined, and bordered with a handsome balustrade, partly in ruins, very massive, and covered with sculptures. On either side are six great platforms, with flights of steps, and on each we find remains of the seven-headed serpent, in some parts mutilated, but on the whole sufficiently preserved, to show distinctly the several heads, some erect as if guarding the entrance, others drawn back in a threatening attitude. A smaller specimen is nearly perfect and very beautiful. We passed into an adutum, watered by gigantic effigies whose mystic forms we could hardly trace. Above us that ponderous roof, tier on tier of solid stone, upheld by enormous columns, and encrusted with strange carvings. Everywhere we found fresh objects of wonder, and each new spot, as we explored it, seemed the greatest wonder of all. In the center of the causeway are two elegant pavilions with porticos, and at the foot of the terrace we came upon two artificial lakes, which in the dry season must be supplied either by means of a subterranean aqueduct or by everlasting springs. A balustrade, not unlike that of the causeway, erected upon a sculptured basement, starts from the foot of the terrace, and runs quite round the temple, with arms or branches descending at regular intervals. The terrace opens into a grand court, crowded with a forest of magnificent columns with capitals, each hewn from a single block of stone. The basement, like every other part of the building, is ornamented in varied and animated styles, and every slab of the vast pile is covered with exquisite carvings, representing the lotus, the lily, and the rose, with arabesques, wrought with the chisel with astonishing taste and skill. The porticos are supported by sculptured columns, and the terraces, which form a cross, have three flights of steps, at each of which are four colossal lions reclining upon pedestals. The temple is thus seen to consist of three distinct parts raised in terraces one above the other. The central tower of the five, within the inner circles, forms an octagon, with four larger and four smaller sides. On each of the four larger faces is a colossal figure of Buddha, which overlooks from its eminence the surrounding country. This combination of four Buddhas occurs frequently among the ruins of Cambodia. The natives call it Phra Mok Bulu, Lord of Our Faces, though not only the face, but the whole body is fourfold. A four-faced god of majestic proportions presides over the principal entrance to the temple, and is called Brahma, or by corruption Phraam, signifying divine protection. As the four cardinal points of the horizon naturally form a cross, called Fram, so we invariably find the cross in the plan of these religious monuments of ancient Cambodia, 
and even in the corridors intersecting each other at right angles. Footnote. The cross is the distinctive character and sign for the doctors of reason in the primitive Buddhism of Kasyapa. End of footnote. These corridors are roofed with great blocks of stone, projecting over each other so as to form an arch, and though laid without cement, so accurately adjusted as to leave scarcely a trace of the joinings. The galleries of the temple also form a rectangle. The ceilings are vaulted, and the roofs supported by double rows of columns, cut from a single block. There are five staircases on the west side, five on the east, and three on each of the remaining sides. Each of the porticos has three distinct roofs, raised one above the other, thus nobly contributing to the monumental effect of the architecture. In some of the compartments, the entire space is occupied with representations of the struggle between angels and giants for possession of the snake god, Sarpadeva, more commonly named Fianach. The angels are seen dragging the seven-headed monster by the tail, while the giants hold fast by the heads. In the midst is Vishnu, riding on the world-supporting turtle. The most interesting of all the sculptures at Nakhon Wat are those that appear to represent a procession of warriors, some on foot, others mounted on horses, tigers, birds, and nondescript creatures, each chief on an elephant at the head of his followers. I counted more than a thousand figures in one compartment, and observed with admiration that the artist had succeeded in portraying the different races in all their physical characteristics, from the flat-nosed savage and the short-haired and broad-faced Laotian to the more classic profile of the Rajput, armed with sword and shield, and the bearded moor, a panorama in life-size of the diverse nationalities it yet displays, in the physical conformation of each race, a remarkable predominance of the Hellenic type, not in the features and profiles alone, but equally in the fine attitudes of the warriors and horsemen. The bas-reliefs of another peristyle represents a combat between the king of apes and the king of angels, and if not the death, at least the defeat of the former. On an adjoining slab is a boat filled with the stalwart rowers with long beards, a group very admirable in attitude and expression. In fact, it is in these bas-reliefs that the greatest delicacy of touch and the finest finish are manifest. On the south side, we found representations of an ancient military procession. The natives interpret these as three connected allegories, symbolizing heaven, earth, and hell. But it is more probable that they record the history of the methods by which the savage tribes were reclaimed by the colonizing foreigners, and that they have an intimate connection with the founding of these monuments. One compartment represents an ovation. Certain personages are seen seated on a dais, surrounded by many women, with caskets and fans in their hands, while the men bring flowers and bear children in their arms. In another place, those who have rejected the new religion and its priests are precipitated into a pit of perdition, in the midst of which sits the judge, with his executioners, with swords in their hands, while the guilty are dragged before him by the hair and feet. In the distance is a furnace, and another crowd of infidels under punishment. But the converted, the born again, are conducted into palaces, which are represented on the upper compartments. In these happier figures, the features as well as the attitudes denote profound repose, and in the faces of many of the women and children one may trace lines of beauty and tender grace. On the east side, a number of men, in groups on either hand, are in the act of dragging in contrary directions the great seven-headed dragon, one mighty angel watches the struggle with interest, while many lesser angels float overhead. Below is a great lake or ocean, in which are fishes, aquatic animals, and sea monsters. 
On another panel, an angel is seated on a mountain, probably Mount Meru, and other angels, with several heads, assist or encourage those who are contending for possession of the serpent. To the right are another triumphal procession and a battle scene, with warriors mounted on elephants, unicorns, griffins, eagles with peacock's tails, and other fabulous creatures, while winged dragons draw the chariots. On the north side is another battle piece, the most conspicuous figure being that of a chief, mounted on the shoulders of a giant, who holds in each hand the foot of another fighting giant. Near the middle of this peristyle is a noble effigy of a royal conqueror, with long, flowing beard, attended by courtiers with hands clasped on their breasts. These figures are all in alto relievo and well executed. The greater galleries are connected with two smaller ones, which in turn communicate with two colonnades in the form of a cross. The roofs of these are vaulted. Four rows of square columns, each still honed from a single block, extend along the sides of the temple. These are covered with statues and bas-reliefs, many of the former being in a state of lapidation, which, considering the extreme hardness of the stone, indicates great age, while others are true chefs d'oeuvre. The entire structure forms a square, and every part is admirable both in general effect and detail. There are twelve superb staircases, the four in the middle having from fifty to sixty steps, each step a single slab. At each angle is a tower. The central tower, larger and higher than the others, communicates with the lateral galleries by colonnades, covered, like the galleries themselves, with a double roof. Opposite each of the twelve staircases is a portico, with windows resembling in form and dimensions those described above. In front of each colonnade, connected with the tower, is a dark, narrow chapel, to which there is an ascent of eight steps. Each of these chapels, which do not communicate with each other, contains a gigantic idol, carved in the solid wall, and at its feet another, of the same proportions, sleeping. This mighty pile, the wondrous Nakhon Bat, is nearly three miles in circumference. The walls are from seventy to eighty feet high, and twenty feet thick. We wandered in astonishment, and almost with awe, through labyrinths of courts, cloisters, and chambers, encountering at every turn some new marvel, unheard of, undreamed of, until then. Even the walls of the outer courts were sculptured with whole histories of wars and conquests, in forms that seemed to live and fight again. Prodigious in size and number are the blocks of stone piled in those walls and towers. We counted five thousand and three hundred solid columns. What a mighty host of builders must ha that have been! And what would have been their engines and their means of transport? seeing that the mountains from which the stone was carried are nearly two days' journey from the temple. All the mouldings, sculptures, and bas-reliefs seem to have been executed after the walls and pillars were in their places, and everywhere the stones are fitted together in a manner so perfect that the joinings are not easy to find. There is neither mortar nor mark of the chisel. The surfaces are as smooth as polished marble. On a fallen column, under a lofty and most beautiful arch, we sat, and rested our very excited eyes, on the wild but quiet landscape below, then slowly, reluctantly departed, feeling that the world contains no monument more impressive, more inspiring, that in its desolation, and yet wondrous preservation, the temple of Mahamanghot Vat. Next morning, our elephants bore us back to Simrap through an avenue of colonnades similar to that by which we had come, and as we advanced we could still descry other gates and pillars far in the distance, marking the line of some ancient avenue to this amazing temple. End of the chapter 29
Chapter Thirty of the English Governess at the Siamese Court by Anna H. Lowenowens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Legend of the Maha Naukon. Footnote. Translated from a M. S. Presented to the author by the Supreme King of Siam. End of footnote. Many hundreds of thousands of years ago, when Phra Atheit, the sun god, was nearer to earth than he is now, and the city of the gods could be seen with mortal eyes, when the celestial sovereigns Phra Indara and Phra In Savara came down from Meru, the sacred mountain, to hold high converse with mortal kings, sages, and heroes, when the moon and the stars brought tidings of good will to men. And wisdom flourished, love and happiness were spread abroad, and sorrow, suffering, disease, old age, and death were almost banished. There lived in Taisiam Pois, a mighty monarch, whose years could hardly be numbered, so many were they, and so long. And yet he was not old, such were the warmth and strength and vigor imparted by the near glories of the Phra Atheid, that the span of human life was lengthened and to a thousand, and even fifteen hundred years. The days of the king Sudarsana had been prolonged beyond those of the oldest of his predecessors, for the sake of his exceeding wisdom and goodness. But yet this king was troubled, he had no son, and he thought of dying without leaving behind him one worthy to represent his name and race, was grievous to him. So by the advice of the wise men of his kingdom, he caused prayers and offerings to be made in all the temples, and took to wife the beautiful princess Tavadi. At that very time Fra Indara, ruler of the highest heaven, dreamed a dream, and behold, in his sleep a costly jewel fell from his mouth to the lower earth, whereat Fra Indara was troubled. Assembling all the hosts of heaven, the angels and the genie, he showed them his dream, but they could not interpret it. Last of all, he told it to his seven sons, but from them likewise its meaning was hidden. A second time Fra Indara dreamed, and yet a third time, that a more and more costly jewel had fallen from his lips, and at last when he awoke, the interpretation was revealed to his own thought, that one of his sons should condescend to the form of humanity, and dwell on the earth, and be a great teacher of men. Then the king of heaven imparted to the celestial princess the meaning of the threefold vision, and demanded which of them would consent to become man. The divine princess heard and answered not a word, till the youngest and best beloved of heaven opened his lips and spake, saying, Hear, O my lord and father, I have yearned towards the race thou hast created out of the fire and flame of thy breast and the smoke of thy nostrils. Let me go unto them, that I may teach them the wisdom of truth. Then Phra Indara gave him leave to depart on his mission of love, and all the hosts of heaven, knowing that he should never more gladden their hearts with his presence, accompanied him, sorrowful, to the foot of Mount Meru, and immediately a blazing star shot from the mount, and burst over the palace of Taisiam Pois. That night the gracious princess Tawadi conceived and became with child, and the Phra Sumanas was no longer a prince of the highest heaven. The princess Tawadi had been the only and darling daughter of a mighty king, and still mourned her separation from her beloved sire. Her only solace was to sit in the frasat of the grand palace, and look with longing towards her early home. Here, day after day, she sat with her maidens, weaving flowers, and singing low the songs of her childhood. When this became known abroad among the multitude, they gathered from every side to behold one so famed for her goodness and beauty. Thus by degrees her interest was aroused. She became thoughtful for her people, and presently found happiness in dispensing food, raiment, and comfort to the poor who flocked to see her. One day, as she was reposing in the porch after her customary benefactions, a cloud of birds, flying eastward, fell dead as they passed over the frassat. 
the sakes and soothsayers of the court, were terrified. What might the omen be? Long and anxious were their counsels, and grievous their perturbations one with another, until at last an aged warrior, who had conquered many armies and subjugated kingdoms, declaring that the faithful servants they should lay the weighty matter before their lord, bade all the court follow him, and approached his sovereign, saying, Long live Fra Shou Fra Sudarsana, lord and king of our happy land, where from sorrow and suffering and death are well nigh banished. Let him investigate with a true spirit and a clear mind the matter we bring for judgment, even though it be to the tearing out of his own heart and casting it away from him. Speak, said the king, and fear not. Has it ever been thought that evil is dearer unto me than good? Even to the tearing out of my heart and casting it to dogs, shall justice be rendered in the land. Then the sage, soothsayers, and warriors spake as with one voice. It is well known unto the Lord our King that the Queen, our lovely lady, Savadi, is with child. But what manner of birth is this that she has conceived, in that it has already brought grief and death into the land? For as the Queen sat in the porch of the temple, a great flight of birds that hastened, thirsty, towards the valleys of the east, when they would have passed over the Frasat, were struck dead, as by an unseen spirit of mischief. Let the king search this matter, and put away the strange thing of evil out of our land, lest it make a greater sorrow. When the king heard these words, he was sore smitten, and hung down his head, and knew not what to say, for the queen, so gentle and beautiful, was very dear to him. But remembering his royal word, he shook off his grief, and took counsel with his astrologers, who had foretold that the unborn prince would prove either a glorious blessing or a dire curse to the land. And now by the awful omen of the birds, they declared that the queen had conceived the evil spirit Kalamata, and that she must be put to death, she and the fiend with her. Then the king in council commanded, that the sweet young Savadi should be set upon a floating raft, and given to the mercy of winds and waves. But the brave chief, who should have executed the sentence, overcome on beholding her beauty and innocence, interceded for her with the council, and it was finally decreed that, for pity's sake, and because the queen was unconscious of any evil, she should not be slain, but put away after the dreadful birth. To this the stricken monarch thankfully agreed. In due time the queen was delivered of a male child, so beautiful that it filled all beholders with delight. His eyes were as sunshine, his forehead like the glow of the full moon, his lips like clustered roses, and his cry like the melody of many instruments. And the queen loved him, and comforted herself with his beauty. When the mother was strong again, the infant prince being then about a month old, the sentence of the council was carried into effect, and the poor princess and her child were banished for ever from the beloved land of Tysiam Pois. Clasping her baby to her breast, she went forth, terrified and stunned. On and on, not knowing whither, she wandered, pressing her sleeping babe to her bosom, and moaning to the great gods above. Then Fra Indara, king of highest heaven, came down to earth, assumed the form and garb of a Brahmin, and followed her silently, shortening the miles and smoothing the rough places, until she reached the bank of a deep and rapid stream. Here, as she sat down, faint and footsore, to nurse her babe, there came to her a grave and venerable pilgrim, who gently questioned her sorrows, and comforted her with thrilling words saying her child was born to bring peace and happiness to earth, and not trouble and death. Quickly Savadi dried her tears, and consented to be led by the good old man, who had come to her as if from heaven. From under his garment he produced a shell, filled with food from paradise, of which she partook with ecstasy, and gave her to drink water from everlasting springs, that overflowed her soul with perfect peace. Then he led her to a mountain, and prepared in the cleft of a rock a hiding-place for her and her child, and left her with a promise of quick return. 
For fifty years she dwelt in the cave, knowing neither trouble nor weariness nor hunger, nor any of the ills of life. The young Somannas, as the good Brahmin had named him, grew to be a youth of wondrous beauty. The melody of his voice tamed the wild creatures of the forest, and charmed even the seven-headed dragons of the lake, in which his mother bathed him every morning. Then again Fra Indara appeared to them in the form and garb of the aged Brahmin, and he rejoiced in the strength and beauty of the young Somannas, and his heart yearned after his beloved son. But hiding his emotion he held pleasant converse with the queen, and begged to be permitted to take the boy away with him for a season. She consented, and instantly, as in a flash of lightning, he transported the prince into the highest heaven, and Somanas found himself seated on a glorious throne by the side of Fra Indara, the divine, before whom the host of heaven bowed in homage. Here he was initiated in all the mysteries of life and death, with all wisdom and foresight. His celestial royal father showed him the stars, coursing hither and thither on their errands of love and mercy, showed him comets with tails of fire flashing and whizzing through the centuries, spreading confusion and havoc in their path, showed him the spirits of rebellion and crime transfixed by the spears of the omnipotent. He heard the music of the spheres, he tasted heavenly food, and drank of the river that flows from the footstool of the Most Highest. And so he forgot the forlorn queen, his mother, and desired to return to earth no more. Then Fra Indara laid his hand upon the brow of the lad, and showed him the generations yet to come, rejoicing in his prayers and precepts, and Somannas, beholding, stretched his arms to the earth again. And Fra Indara promised to build him a palace, hardly less grand and fair than the heavenly abode, a temple which should be the wonder of the world, a stupendous and everlasting monument of his love to man. So Sumanas returned to the queen, his mother, and Fra Indara sent down myriads of angels, with Fya Kralevana, chief of angels, to build a dwelling fit for the heavenly prince. In one night it was done, and the rising sun shone on domes like worlds and walls like armies. And because the seven-headed serpent, Fya Nak, had shown the way to the mines of gold and silver and iron, and the quarries of marble and granite, the grateful builders laid the sign of the serpent on the foundations, terraces and bridges, but on the walls they left the effigy to the Queen Thavadi, the beautiful and bountiful lady. Then swift-winged angels flew to heaven, and returning brought fruits and flowers, the most curious and exquisite, and immediately there bloomed a garden there, of such ravishing loveliness and perfume, that the gods themselves delighted to visit it. Also they filled the great stables with white elephants and chargers. And then the angels transported Thavadi and Somannas to their new abode, the fame of which was so spread abroad, that the great king Sudarsana, with all his court and followers without number, and all his army came to see it. And great was their astonishment to find again the fair and gentle Thavadi, who thus was reunited to her husband, and he took up his abode with her, and they lived together in love. But the prince Samanas built temples, and preached, and taught the people, and healed their infirmities, and led them in the path of virtue and truth. And the fame of his wisdom and goodness flew through all the lands, so that many kings became willing vassals unto him. But there came from a far-off country, where the heavens drop no rain, but where one great river suddenly floods the plains and then shrinks back into itself like a living thing, a king of lofty stature and exceeding craft. And the prince Samanas was gracious toward him, and showed him many favors. But his heart was black and bad, and he would have turned the pure heart of the prince to worship the dragon and other beasts. Wherefore Somanas changed him into a leper, and cast him out of his palace, and caused a stone statue to be made of him, which stands to this day, a warning to all tempters and evildoers. 
and he caused the face of the great Phra Indara to be carved, on the north and on the south, and on the east and on the west, so that all men might know the true God, who is God alone in heaven, Sevag Savan. End of chapter 30 And this is also the end of the English governess at the Siamese court. Thank you for listening.